<clears throat> thanks for coming. I appreciate the time. Um, we're going to talk about network programming. This, this entire thing is baked around as much participation as possible. What I'd like to try to do is I put an OVA out on a, a website. Everything that we do today is going to be uh, on that website. All the code listings, the PowerPoints, the OVA. What I'd like to happen, if possible, if you guys right now could download it. Um, do you want to do that? Just raise, show of hands. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I've baked a lot of time into this, so we are not going to get, uh, let me step back before I do. First, let me do this. Let's bring up, let me just talk about this first real quick. What's, what's available, what's out there? Um, I did this last year uh, at, in Vegas, and I did it again, and around January time frame, um, like an idiot, <laughs> I said, you know what, I'm going to tear this all down and do it again. So since like mid-January to this morning, I've been like putting videos together, code snippets, just for today's session, we have between 40 and 50 uh, code listings. And again, you have access to them all. But <clears throat> the point is, there's like 13 hours of video on the Python programming language itself and background, and then what we're going to do today. And I put it in a repository on, on a box account, and here's where you go to get everything, right? So uh, this is the stuff from January, and I think I have this, this uh, baked in. <clears throat> so the first one is just a spreadsheet on you know, what videos are out there and what, what it covers for all things. There's, there's four parts to this, right? The um, first part, part one, it's just a little background on Python, the language, you know, some pros and cons of two versus three, that kind of stuff. Second part is, uh, talks about a couple of videos around installing Python, installing, you know, virtual environment, installing pip, uh, some of the things you run into, differences between two and three, running two and three on the same box, uh, that sort of thing. Then um, about 13 hours of videos, excruciating detail, as much as you want on uh, Python. Uh, everything from, uh, you name it, it's out there. So uh, along with code listings, code examples. And then what we're going to talk about today is in the DevNet sessions. There's actually an extra session I have, um, we're not going to touch on, and that's where I was uh, throwing in some stuff on, on crypto. But um, just an aside, so what's in there? What's in part four? Well, this. So there's this PDF, and I think the latest one's up there just before I got kicked out of my hotel room. There's uh, a listing of everything that's in these, these um, directories, these folders. There's the OVA, which you can go get right now, pull down. It took me about 10 minutes. I, I stood it up there yesterday, made some changes this morning. So it took me about 10 minutes to, to bring it down. Um, there's, I took all the code that we're going to talk about and put it into topics like uh, you know, uh, TCP, UDP topic, a topic on spreadsheets, a topic on you know, this, that, and the other thing, and put them all in one folder so that later when you're looking at this, you can go back and you know, just drill in on, you know, HTTP or whatever. And then what we're going to talk about today, we're going to break it into three parts, part one, part two, and part three. And they're just, I just took all the listings and dumped them in there. And then finally, uh, the actual VirtualBox setup environment that I have on my PC. If anybody's got VirtualBox, this will run on VMware Player as well. And I have the uh, URL for this embedded in every slide, so I won't blow by it. Um, and then uh, kind of an install log, just a little text file on all the commands that I did to configure the Ubuntu VM, you know, installing GNOME and, and Python and, and what have you. So it'll be kind of a step-by-step. -step. But again, the entire purpose of this is to get feedback from you. Um, so if this doesn't work for you, if it's too fast, too slow, you're not getting it, whatever, you know, give me the high sign, uh, you know, whatever. All right, so <clears throat> there's also 
the link, the primary link to what I just talked about is here, right? That's, that's to, that points you to, to uh, part four. You can go there right now. Raise your hand if you can't get there. And then uh, I did some blogs um, like in January. There's like three of them. I did one this morning as well. It's got the links to everything. Uh, the reason I bring it up is it not only points to that box, but there's a piece in there on uh, Pi Crypto, which is a module for Python to do uh, cryptographic stuff. Now, we'll be doing some SSL stuff if we have time today. <laughs> we'll be doing some SSL stuff um, and some hashing, but uh, there's a whole, there's like seven videos in the Pi Crypto folder uh, on how to do it, right? Uh, and that brings us to our first program. This is just a massive, massive amount of code. Wow, screen is horrible. It's going to like totally fry your brain. But Python comes with a whole boatload of stuff. And one of the things that it comes with as part of the built-in library is a web browser, web browser control. So um, let me bring that code up again. So you can see, to go to that URL, we, ha we only have, I thought this came up, we only have a couple of, um, couple of lines of code that are not displaying. No, no big deal. Can everybody see that? What the hell? Uh, yeah, it's only... Um, only looking at the screen, at the uh, PowerPoint. All right, so while we're waiting, how many people uh, are comfortable with Python? Let's see a, a show of hands. Who's fooled around with it? Who's kind of comfortable with it, like more than fooled around with it, like it, kind of messing with it? Show of hands. All right, let's see, show of hands. Who's thinking right now, Vince, I should be teaching this. Not you, I should be up here. All right, good, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a very good thing. Uh, any programmers here? Oh, uh, you'll have to leave. <laughs> the reason I say that is, no, please don't leave. The reason I say that is, you are about to see, like telling a programmer that his code is bad, it's you know, not bulletproof or it's not robust or it's not efficient or whatever, is like saying somebody, hey dude, your baby is ugly, right? You never ever do that. So I'm warning you up front, uh, you are about to see probably the ugliest code that has ever been written by a human, right? There is absolutely no error correction. There is, there is nothing. If something goes wrong, it crashes. So you're gonna see a lot of that today. The point is, when you talk about, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, in the programming community, the sense I get, great people, the sense I get is in the, the programming community, they, they tend to think in terms of abstraction, scale, efficiency, um, on that level. Me, for us, in the networking community, I don't know about you guys, but I cannot do a thing without seeing a network diagram. I mean, I, I can't think. I gotta I got see a network diagram before I can do anything, right? We think, we have a tendency to think in terms of uh, of block diagrams and schematics, right? So the reason I bring this up is to not to disparage programmers at all. On the contrary, they've built an unbelievably flexible platform in Python. It's completely open. That is, all of the libraries that we're going to use or look at, everything from low-level communication sockets to you name it, you can go in yourself and, and look at how it works, break it down, make changes if you want. So from their perspective, Python is an object-oriented language, which means you do a whole bunch of stuff with object orientation. And that's pretty much as far as I'm going to go with it. Uh, I am going to talk about it. I have to talk about it at one aspect during this, this talk. But you know, it's all well and fine if you have an object-oriented mindset 
But what we, what the benefit that we as network engineers can get out of this language is the exact opposite. We can build, it allows us to build small, quick hit utilities, things that, you know, if there's a fire somewhere, we need to get into something, we need to do something. You know, we don't have to learn object-oriented programming. We can, it's called, it's the difference between pop and op. Object-oriented programming and procedural-oriented programming, right? Procedural-oriented programming is just the way that it used to be, like a monolithic, you build a monolithic program, you do this line, then that line, then this line, then that. Object-oriented programming is you're spitting objects off, right? You're passing, you know, you're doing all kinds of stuff, right? Everybody get this? So, let's see if we uh, got anything back. So what we're gonna cover, what our agenda is gonna be, we're gonna talk about the Python basics um, to as much degree as possible. Then we're gonna, we're gonna look at the, really the guts of everything that we do, and that is the socket module, the socket library. Um, I mean, we, we ruminate, run around, and get crazy about, you know, things like OSPF and SPF calculation times and EIGRP and, you know, SDLC, all that kind of stuff. We tend to have uh, our, you know, washing our hands usually occurs where our, our frame or our packet hits the adapter. I'm out of here. I'm done. I got your packet to its destination. I don't care. A programming perspective, it's usually, you know what, uh, I wrote it, it doesn't break, it scales, I did the bench testing, I did regression testing, I went through, went through the databases of past hours, it, it ran with flying colors, I've passed it off to the operating system, hey, I'm great, I don't care. So there's a middle ground where, um, you know, there is huge implications, you know, when they come pounding on your door saying your network stinks, right, it's your network, and you go back to them and say, it's your program, right, there's this whole gray area that is absolutely radically impacted by what we're going to talk about today, right? And again, looking for as much feedback as possible. Is anybody downloading the OVA? Good. Anyone else? Good. How are we making out? Slow? Too slow? Uh, bummer. Uh, well, uh, on second thought, you know, uh, keep doing that, certainly the OVA, but all the listings are out there as well, so if you've got Python installed, all you got to do is pull the listings down. Do, uh, yeah, I, th I tried to um, kind of shrink this down and use only generic Python wherever possible. I think I only use like three modules, three libraries, so, uh, and they're listed on what I'm going to show you here. So we're going to talk about uh, the basics. Uh, working with the command line, we're going to talk about <coughs> files and directories a little bit. Then we're going to talk about the core of everything. Everything that holds, everything that a browser does down to that network adapter, out through the network to the other side. And that is sockets. Uh, anything, uh, you know, from an APIC controller to your web browser to anything that touches a network is going in the direction of a network is going to go through a socket library. And it is unbelievably easy to use. That was the whole purpose of building it, to make it as easy as possible. Uh, we'll talk about a little, what, what can we get from the, the network stack, our stack on our machine, without having to go in and do any you know, configurations. Like, how easy is it to do a directory, a DIR, right? Well, you've got those utilities in Python as well. We'll talk about We'll do a little stuff with uh, UDP. Again, we'll talk about sockets. We'll briefly touch on object-oriented programming because it does come into play in what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we'll talk about in, in using the socket library, you've got to answer five questions, right? Really four, but we'll talk about the big five. We'll talk about socket objects and uh, socket names. What's the socket name? Then we'll move on to TCP. Um, and to do that, you know, to really have an effective kind of example, we're going to have to talk about uh, how you parse through directories and files, right? Because that's what, we, you know, that's what TCP does, right? We're going to do a little file transfer. Um, you know, some simple message pass. We'll start out with simple message passing. Then we'll do some file transfers. 
you know, just a simple file transfer. Then, then we'll add in a directory search function, right? So we're, we're incrementally building stuff on top of it. Um, then we're going to talk about, you know, how we tell if anybody's messing with our stuff. Uh, we're going to spend a little time on security. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about how we create a hash, a one-way hash. We have a couple of utilities that you can use to generate different hashes when you, when you type something in. We'll actually do some one-way hash generation. We'll verify just a little example of, you know, a bad example of how you could verify that nobody's messing with your stuff, right? You leave it out on a server, it comes back, somebody monkeyed with it, and you'll be able to tell, right? And then uh, we'll, we'll um, use uh, a little time around establishing an SSL connection, right? So what, as network engineers and architects, what do we do better than anybody on the planet? We, we tunnel. Don't, don't go there. We tunnel. You name it, our entire existence is probably 90% of our existence and what we do during the day has something to do with some kind of tunnel. A VPN connection, you know, a layer two over layer three connection, something that involves a tunnel, of, an MPLS connection, something that involves some kind of tunnel. So the way that Python and any other programming language handles, you can't send stuff in the clear text, right? Got the whole, you know, sneaky NSA thing going on, sniffing lines and all that kind of stuff. So you got to encrypt it. So SSL has become the de facto way to do that. And the way that that uh, gets done is the way that we're going to talk about it. And guess how they do it? They tunnel your existing connection through an, an encrypted session. It's very easy, and it's the exact same concept that we all know and love, that we, you know, we, uh, we get, right? Then what we'll talk about are some quote-unquote higher layer protocols. So I threw this one in. I actually like this demo. Um, XML RPC, right? Um, what we'll do is, in order to do this the right way, we're, we're going to have to have a little primer on spreadsheets. And again, it's all out there. We'll do that first, then we'll, we'll set up an XML RPC server. We'll do some stuff with it. Why XML RPC? Any ACI guys around here? Any SDN people? So what's the big thing with SDN? It's like, hey, I got this center of the world intelligence that has visibility to the entire topology. And I just tell my topology what to do. And it let it go figure it out. Well. You know, as an example, uh, the ACI APIC, when you build policies up on that thing, you ship it down into a leaf, that policy, and then the leaf magically translate that, translated into MAC addresses and routing tables and all that stuff, right? It's called the rendering. Well, the mechanism that gets used to do that is XML RPC, right? So we'll see how we can use it with spreadsheets. Uh, and again, everything that we talk about here has you know, implications for what we do. And again, the idea isn't to make you like super programmers, because I am certainly not a super programmer. It is to like give you a sense of some of the things that will happen, to give you like a, a basic uh, framework around uh, Python, so you can go in and start kicking the tires, build a few utilities for yourself. You know, get a seat at the table when some programmers are, you know, considering, uh, you know, doing something that involves a network, which is really everything anymore. Um, then we'll talk about, finally, we're not going to get to this point, but we'll talk about REST, uh, HTTP. We'll talk about, uh, you know, an example of an APIC REST uh, exchange where we add some tenants. And again, we're not going to have time to do this. But again, anything that we don't cover in this session, uh, I'm going to continue to add to the uh, distribution, the, the repo. And I'll add some videos for anything we don't cover. Sounds good? Anything that you guys wanted to hear in particular? Anything else? Uh, anybody get a chance to pull down the code? All right. We'll, we'll just hang with that. So what's the point of all this? Again, the point of all this is 
don't reinvent the wheel. Anything, I will guarantee you, anything that you can think of that you would like to see as a program, I will guarantee you it's already been done. There's a repository called PyPy. Uh, it's like the, you know, the primary repository where you get stuff. It's a very simple process of downloading modules and importing them into your code, right? The other point is, and the, the entire point is, there's an old axiom, right? Good programmers write code. Great programmers steal code, right? It used to be a thing where programmers would like, you know, get these date and time routines that they would develop on their own, and they get like, you know, currency conversion routines, and they'd hold on to them. They'd build up over time this, this library of stuff, right, that they were very proud of, right? And that's where, you know, experience came from. Well, along came, you know, uh, co-collaboration, new business models, and open source environment. That stuff has gone away. Um, so, the point of all this is there is a tremendous amount of stuff that's open and readily available for you to learn. So, let's start talking about some of the command line basics. Um, like six programs here. Uh, this is actually, I broke this up this morning, follow command line. We'll talk about <clears throat> how you take input from a command line when you launch a Python program, right? How you take additional parameters, how you can manipulate that. Then we'll talk about working with files, you know, some examples of directories and strings. We'll talk about how you get information about a file, you know, it's a file size, you know, it's modification date, you know, that sort of stuff. We'll do a little cheap, really weak, super weak, do not use this encryption uh, example, right? Um, we'll do an encryption and a de-encryption then we'll do, uh, we'll follow that with uh, uh, like a, a poor man's ping, if you will. Okay, let's, so let's jump in. Um, everybody's launched a program, right? And you go, this is launching a program from the command line. And in fact, we're launching, in this case, we're launching a Python program. And here we're starting out with the, the interpreter, the Python interpreter, right? The program name, and then some variables, right, that we're going to pull in. So how do we do that, right? So that, when a program gets set up, any, any programming language, gets, it gets pulled into memory, the operating system hands off control of that, that program. Uh, as part of that setup, builds a little structure in memory, a little area in memory, where it's got all the details that that program needs to know about in order to execute, right? In the old days, it used to be a program segment prefix, and that, that had all these special things that you could look at that told you about the environment, that told the program about the environment that it was running in. Well, one of those areas is the command line, right? And it's located, let's see if I put this here, it's located in a special area um, called argv. Now, it can be called anything, but it's standard practice to call it argv. And argv is accessible, the way that you get into that area, that it's just a list. Uh, the way that you get into that area is through the Python sys module. So the, the module, the library, that lets you go and pull stuff off the command line and, and let you understand what program is running is called sys. And sys has a special variable called argv. And argv is nothing but a list. Anybody familiar with lists, Python lists? How easy are Python lists? The easiest thing that's ever been created or, or what? Right? No, I'm serious. So the way, the way that it gets presented to you, the way that argv presents this to you, is as a list. So this is offset 0 of argv. This is offset 1. This is offset 2, right? That's the way you can you know, pull things off, put things on. <clears throat> yeah, so we got, uh, you know, subscript zero is the first position. This is the actual program name. And again, the parameters, as many as you want. So why, why is the program name considered to be a command line? Why do you think? 
because the program that actually is running is the Python interpreter. Python is different. It's an interpreted language. What does that mean? It means it takes your source code, just a bunch of statements, and it sucks them in, right? This, it's a super program that runs. It sucks each, it's each statement in, one at a time, and looks at it and says, yeah, that's okay, all right, you can go. Looks at the next one, says, yeah, that's okay, you can go. Looks at the next one, says, no, nah, that's all right. Bang, it comes down, right? So your script, your program, quote unquote program, is actually a parameter that's getting passed to the Python interpreter. Everybody understand that? So contrast that to a compiled program, something like C or Assembler or you know, uh, Java. What they do is the uh, compiler takes those statements, you feed in the whole block of stuff, the compiler says, yeah, that's okay, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. Nope, got an error here. I'm stopping. You're not allowed to create anything, not allowed to go forward until you fix that error. You go back, you change it, you come back, you feed it into the compiler, it says, yeah, okay, I'll generate some object, uh, an object file, and now I'll let you link in your libraries to that object file, and I'll glue them all together, and then you'll have an executable program that you can run. Python lets you take modules and libraries, but it does it all at runtime. Does it all at runtime. Now, there are, you can get to the point where you can compile Python programs, uh, you know, make executors, but that's, you know, primarily this is the way it functions. Everybody all right with this? Is this too slow, too fast? Speed it up, slow down? Give me the high sign if this is not working. Just don't throw any eggs or tomatoes. <laughs> All right, so let's look at our first uh, command line program. And I hope it comes up on the screen. What we're going to talk about is actually, I broke this into three pieces actually this morning. Um, it's called follow command line. All the listings start out with the word follow because this session is about a follow along session, right? So hence the imaginative name of follow. So this is follow command line. It's going to use, it's an example of using the sys module, pulling stuff um, you know, from the command line, putting stuff on the command line, how to work with functions, Python functions, um, how to do something called typecasting. Does anybody understand typecasting? Very common in Python? Okay, we'll, we'll go through that. So uh, it, for all this presentation, the expectation is we're not going to get through this whole thing today, but uh, I took some screenshots where I could, so when you're digesting this later, uh, it'll be helpful, hopefully. So let's do this. Let's jump out. Let's fire up our, uh, okay, Ubuntu is there. Does anybody have this code? You can write this down now if you want, or pull it down from the, uh, okay. It's out there. So the, um, by the way, again, the, the VM that I'm using, I pulled down from HashiCorp. Uh, there's a site, it's, again, it's in the setup um, instructions. It's got uh, all the passwords for everything. It, it's just vagrant. So this is user vagrant, command, uh, password vagrant. All the uh, certificates, I had to generate my own certificates to talk about the SSL stuff. Those passwords are, are uh, vagrant, so if in doubt, just type in vagrant. So here's our environment. What are we going to do? Let's look at, on this box, we've installed uh, the idle uh, IDE, the integrated development environment for Python. And it's this little doohickey here, the Python symbol. So let's open up. Let's open up our first one. It's in part one. Um, nope, that's not it. It is in part one, number one, two, and three. All right. So this is just to walk us through. Again, if this is boring anybody, please let me know. I, I'd be happy to spin up. We've got a lot to talk about today. 
So this is just an example of printing and determining how many files or how many commands are on the command line. So what we're doing is this is the module that gets us some of the internals you know, to our operating environment. It's called sys. I'm in your way here. <clears throat> Below that is just a fancy way of printing. I'm saying within those parentheses, print 77 equal signs, just a little border across the top of the screen. Then I'm saying, you know, just printing out, look, I'm going into the command line, I'm, I'm looking at argv, and I'm saying, look, here's the program name. Um, and then you'll see something called len. What we're doing is len. And len is just a function in Python that gives you the length of what's ever between the parentheses. So in this case, I'm taking that special area, sys arg, and I'm running len on it. And I'm coming up with the length of you know, that, that special area. How many, how many elements are in that area, right? You see that? And I'm taking that number, and I'm putting it in a variable called arg, uh, arg nums, I guess, yeah. Then I'm taking, I'm just printing out that, what Len came up with, the count, and I'm saying, you know, here's the program name as well. I'm going to offset zero of that special area, subscript zero, offset zero of that list. And I'm printing out that name. Then I'm doing my first if statement, and I'm saying the number, that variable that I got from Len, that's stored in that variable, if it's greater than one, then I know I've got parameters on that command line, right? Because I know in that special area, I, I at least have my program name. If I've got anything more than that, it's a parameter of some kind, right? So if it's greater than one, I'm going to say, I'm going to print out sysargv, you know, the first parameter of the command line is this. If it's not, I know there's no parameters on that command line, right? So I say there's nothing on that, that command line. Everybody get that? Is this, like, completely foreign? Sorry? Can we make it bigger? Is there any way to make it? Uh... How's that? No. <laughs> uh, let's let's try to let's try to scratch the screen here. Uh, sorry. To. Uh, Increase the font size, we could try that. Try that. Is that all right? Everybody in the back? Okay. So, <laughs> I need these things too. Um, so everybody see this? Everybody get this? Yeah. Sorry? Sorry. The code that I download from the box, it's not the same. So this morning, before I got kicked out of my hotel room, mm -hmm. I took this program, it was, it was one big program, and it was hyper confusing. So I stripped it into three parts. So it may not be up on the repository, but I'll show you, let me show you what you're looking at, I think. Let me just show you, and we can go through this one if you'd rather. I may have deleted it actually, but uh, actually I did. This is, uh, what you're looking at is follow command line, and I just broke it up into three to try to, is it out there? Is it on the, the... all right, that's the only one I changed, I promise. Everything else, <laughs> everything else should be good. Famous last words. All right, so here we go. All right, ready? Everybody get where we're coming from? Let's run the module, and there we go. We see, you know, the fancy lines that come out, we see the command line, 
and the list, the contents of the list, run the side, contents of the list, we, we've got the number of arguments that came from where? Where we get that number? Len. We got that number from Len. Um, we went in, looked at the program name, and guess what? There was nothing on the command line, right? So let's look at number two. Uh, let's go to part one. Go to number two. Everybody see this? Pretty good? So here, we're doing the exact same thing, uh, only a little bit more. What we're saying is uh, empty command line, remember? Had nothing in that list. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to append. It's a list, right? So we can use the common Python append command. Uh, you guys are pretty much familiar with lists, right? Anybody not? Um, so Python has an append, and it just simply does what? It appends, right? So I'm taking a string, and I'm appending it into that special area. And I'm taking another string, and I'm appending it right beside it. Hello, world. And when it read it, it, it now says, it's going to say, it's going to ask Lynn, again, it's going to find out how big that, that string is, that, that list. It's going to tell you what the arguments are, and it's just going to drop through each one of them. Everybody OK with this? All right, let's run it. There we go. It's, um, we go, get this stuff out of here. We go, the same thing, we're printing out, here's the command line, here's that special area we dumped out, hello world was appended on programmatically. We said, there's now three arguments in there. Here's a pro, uh, the program name, here's hello and world. Right? So just as we can put stuff into the list, we can take stuff out of the list. Let me just open up number three. Now this is a little more involved. What we're doing here is essentially the same thing. We're doing the same thing, uh, printing the fancy little equal signs. Uh, don't worry about this for a minute. We're doing, we're appending, we're reappending these two strings because this is a new program, right? Putting them on the command line, asking Len, um, and then we'll, we'll go down a little bit here, down the listing. Where this is another way that you'll see very common practice in Python to get parameters off a list. What we're doing is, in this if statement, before we, we did, we queried len for how many elements were in this list, we did that on a, a line. Well, here, we're just combining everything into one line. So as you know, an if or a uh, decision uh, mechanism within any programming language, it's going to take what is ever on that line and boil it down until it gets either true or false, right? So, when Python sees the keyword if, it's going to go all the way to the end of this colon. And it's going to say, OK, before I do anything, I've got to evaluate everything on this line between the colon and the if statement. And I'm going to boil it down and boil it down and boil it down until it becomes true or false. So in this case, and what you'll see very frequently in Python is you know, uh, commands wrapped in commands wrapped in commands, right? So, this is going to boil down to either true or false. If there's zero, this will be false. If there's something there, it'll be one or greater. So that will, if it's, if it's greater, it'll mean that there's more than one thing on the line, right? So it'll drop into this. It'll tell us what the first parameter is. Fancy stuff here. Then we'll input. This is the way in Python 2.7 that you take input uh, from the user. And it's called raw input. And it's a significant difference between three and two, how you take input from the, the user. In 2.7 and below, uh, when you input something, when you, when you uh, issue this command, raw input, you will always get a string. You will always get a string, right? 
So if you input the number one, two, three, four, five, that's going to be a string. The problem, which is great, it's easy to work with. It's a sequence. The problem with it, though, is when you go to do a mathematical operation, I need numbers to do that, not character representations, right? So I need to be able to take a string and somehow convert it into a number temporarily so I can do math on it and then, you know, let it go back to being a string. And that's what we call typecasting. Everybody good with that? It's a very common practice across all programming languages. So we're going to show, we're going to uh, enter something on the command line. Then we're going to do something, uh, we're going to call a function. Is anybody familiar with a function, Python function? One, two. So Python function is just a way to group a bunch of stuff uh, into a, an area within the program, execute that on its own, and then return back to where you came from. And in this case, the way that we do it is here's where we call the function. We're calling it with the value that we entered from the user. And then what we're doing is up here, way up here, I have this statement that defines the function. A def statement creates a function. I give it a name. In this case, I'm calling it function example. And then I, I just say, hey, there's going to be some value passed in here. When you get called, there's going to be a value given to you. You know, you worry about it, what, what happens with it inside your function, right? So we're going to get into the function. We're going to print out a bunch of stuff. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to print out, we're going to execute this little uh, method called type. And type just tells you the type of data that you're working with. In our case, we passed in a string. Uh, if we pass in a number, it would, it'll say integer, right? Um, it's just a way to help you identify what you're working with, right? Uh, we're going to print out that value. Then we're going to say, we're going to try to do some math on it. We're going to uh, do a typecast here. We're taking the value that we passed into the function. We're going to typecast it as an integer, a number, and we're going to add 100 to it. And when we're done that, we're going to return to the function that, to the, uh, the thing that called us. Now, why did we have to put the function up here and not down here? The, exactly right. Exactly right. Um, Python is an interpreter, and all interpreters work the same way. They start at the top, and they keep chugging on down, keep going, 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 until they hit you know, something that they can recognize and they react to. So Python will come in, start sucking in these, these source statements, and it'll see this def. And it'll say, you know what, that's a function. I'm not going to worry about that right now. But I am going to mark where it is. I am going to track where that function is, because I know somebody's going to call it down the road. So he doesn't do anything with this. He skips it. He comes here. He says, oh, that's a print. So I'm going to execute this. I'm going to do this, 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 bang, 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 bang. I'm going to come on down to, to this line. Come on down to here, and he's going to say, oh, he's calling this function called function example, and he's giving it a value. So I'm going to take his value, I'm going to put it on the stack, and I remembered where that, that function was defined, where it is in memory, and I'm going to go hunt that down, and I'm going to pass it that value. Everybody understand that? So... Here, what we're gonna, what's going to happen is we're going to go execute that, and we're going to calculate, do that calculation, add 100 to whatever it is, and we're going to return it. But guess what? We just called it with the value. We didn't print it out, so it's not going to display. Right? So what we're going to do is do that again. And only this time, we're still going to get a string. We're going to put it in a value. We're going to call it, but we're going to include that function call on a print line. So again, what Python does, being an interpreter, it does what? It interprets, right? So it's going to come down here and it's going to say, oh, I, I know I got to print, but I got a whole bunch of stuff I got to do before that. So let me go do this. And when it comes back, he's just going to, that return statement 
is going to have some value passed back on the stack. I'm going to pull that off, and I'm going to print whatever he gives me. So if you return back junk, he's going to try to print junk. If you return back a good number, he's going to, re he's going to do that. Everybody get that? Is this too? F Yo, yep. Could you repeat that? Oh. <laughs> Is it on? Yeah, on the function, you start your function block with a colon, but you don't end it. So how does he know that the, the code for that function is finished and you continue with the rest of your code? So that is a great question. The gift time, man. Okay. Uh, that is a great question because it brings up a fundamental aspect of Python. It is absolutely the way Python, basic functionality of Python. What happens is you're absolutely right. He sees this. He goes to the end of this colon. He says, OK, I got something coming up. I'm going to maintain track of it. I'll, keep, I'll, I'll remember where it is. He gets called. He drops in here, and he hits this return statement. And he says, OK, whoever called me, you know when, does everybody know what the stack is? It's just a, a scratch pad for a computer uh, program. So when I call that function, when I call a function, I'm going to say, OK, I'm here right now. Uh, I'm going to put this address on the stack, and then I'm going to go to where that function is. And not only am I going to put where I am right now, but I'm going to put that value on the stack as well. And away I go into the function. The function then pulls that value off the stack. He goes down, he does his stuff, he comes to the end, and he says, okay, let me pop off the last value from the stack, which is the guy who called me. Everybody get that? That's important to understand. So, whenever Python sees a return, he's going to jump back to whatever, whoever called it. The other point is, I don't even need to code a return. Because if you'll notice, all the indentation here, this is all indented. This is not. That's the way, there's no indentation here. That's the way that Python knows, the interpreter knows, that this is, this is immediately to be executed. Right? If it sees any kind of indentation, it's going to know that that's either a function or it's a conditional. Right? So let me, let me show you another example. So this is all indented. Uh, if we go to our if statement, I hope we have one in here. Uh, we don't. But you, I mean, on the last one, you saw an if statement, and then you saw indentation. Four spaces in will tell Python, you know, a, this whole thing is part of this function. When it sees the D indent, the first D intent character, that's how it knows the scope of this, this uh, function. Does that answer your question? It's a great question. That's fundamental. That will, that will cause you untold pain if you don't get that done. Four spaces. Not three, not seven, not 11. There's one, two, three, four. Good catch. All right, uh, so let's run this guy. So uh, here we have, I won't get in your way here. So we're, we're saying we're going we're gonna to append hello and world to the command line. Then we're going to pop that last value, you know, which is world. We did the, with the pop command. Let's see if we can find it right there. There's where we popped it. So now instead of three, we've got two. Um, then we're going to look at the, the uh, first parameter on the command line, which is offset one, right? Now we're going to enter a number here. Let's say one, two, three, four. Uh, so we entered one, two, three, four. Now it called that function, and it did the calculation. And I know it called it and did the calculation because it didn't blow up, right? Uh, but we forgot to print it. Right? So there's nothing there. Because all we did was call the function with the uh, value. Right? So now let's do that again. One, two, three, four. And there we have it. What happened was we hit that print statement, and it saw we were calling a function with a value, and said, oh, i got to do this first. 
And whatever that return statement gives me back, I'm going to print that out. And that's what we saw there. Is this okay? What do you guys think? This is feedback time. This is where I stop talking and you start talking. Good exchange. Yeah. <laughs> So did I really get this right? Indentation defines functions and things, and it needs to be exactly four spaces. Not seven, not eight, four. It's got to be four. Oh my. In anywhere where you have, where you indent, Python is going to treat that as either a conditional, an if statement, or a while, or something. Anywhere, it's, it's going to see a keyword, and then it's going to try to, you know, it's going to say, all right, let me look underneath that. Yeah, he's got stuff in there. Uh, because I know that's part of either the function or the if statement or whatever, because it is indented. And the minute that it sees something not indented, it's going to say, OK, well, that's where the function ends. Does that make sense? How do you organize it? So I'm sorry? Sorry. How do I organize my code and how do, uh, what happens when I try to nest things, if statement in an if statement? So within this, let's bring up that function again. It's a good question. So within this function, uh, think of this as its own little world, right? Because Python saw this at the beginning while it was coming down. It saw this def statement. Uh, and it saw all this junk in here as indented. So it knows all this junk in here belongs to that function. So let's say I was going to call another function within this function, right? I would just make a call here, indented. And underneath this, I could say something like this. I don't know. Let's make up a name. Def, you know, uh, hello uh, value. And what I would do is, watch this, when I hit, when I hit enter, the idle interpreter is automatically going to shift me over four places. Because it says, hey, if you want statements and you want to be part of this function, you've got to indent it. Same thing will happen when you enter an if statement or a while or any conditional. Is that all right? Does that answer your question? Is, that, is everybody OK with this? Yeah. You, you can have multiple indentations. So uh, in that uh, function, the next one, if you define an if statement within that uh, function, it it's will It's got to be indented. Let's do that. That's a great question. Anything that we're doing, anything that belongs to that function, has got to be indented. So in this case, I'm going to say, you know, print, print, you know, I don't know, hello. Then I'm going to say, you know, let's do this. Uh, you know, word equals is assigned to hello. So here I'm going to assign a string called word, uh, assign a string called hello to the variable, to a variable. To, sorry? Uh, to a variable called hello. Okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to hold that word hello. Now I'm going to say, in the line here, notice that it's still indenting my second line. Now I'm going to say if word is equal to hello colon, what does the colon do? It tells Python what to evaluate between the if keyword and the colon. So now it's going to say, okay, let's indent again. We'll say print, you know, hello world. Does that make sense? Going to keep indenting under that if statement, right? Print. Yeah, sorry, that was me. Going to keep indenting, print. Yeah, I don't know, world. It's going to keep going until I go back, until I go back to what was under that if statement, right? Does, does everybody see that? So I've indented 
this whole thing, Python knows that this whole thing belongs to this function because of the indentation. And notice, I didn't put a return statement here. So Python's going to come in here, he's going to assign this value, he's going to do this conditional, he's going to see it's true, he's going to do this, this, and then he's going to see this underneath it, and he's going to say, oh, okay, I'm back to the regular program. Everybody see that? Seriously, does everybody see that? Is, that, is this okay? This is this too fast or too slow? Because we're going to kind of speed it up. It's good? Okay. Uh, let, let, let's actually try to call this. What do we call it? Called it hello. Print hello. And uh, we passed in a value, right? Uh, I don't know. Value to. Uh, let's call it. Oh, we didn't do anything with it, so let's let's just say, hi. So we're going to call it. And we should see our stuff. Yeah. There's where we did all the crazy hello stuff. Right? Everybody okay? Too slow? Too fast? We haven't, we haven't even started talking about communications yet. All right. Uh, so where are we? We are... I'll get to this program. Oh, you know what I didn't do? I didn't talk about the setup. You guys want to take a look at this real quick? Just real quick. The setup that we have, and this is out on the website um, uh, for the virtual box. I got everything from HashiCorp. They have a, a set, a series of virtual boxes out there for everything from Windows to Ubuntu to CentOS to you name it. And they're all pre-configured. You can download them. Um, this is the site. These are the URLs. Anybody, any programmers here with a dirty mind? I saw this, and it cracked me up. Who said programmers don't have a sense of humor? You get? OK. You don't have to get that, because we're network people. But, so that's, the, that's where you get the box, the Ubuntu box. This is what it looks like on my machine. So I have, I'm running VirtualBox running VirtualBox. I've got a VM that I downloaded earlier. That's what we've been playing with up until now. Both of them have virtual NIC cards uh, with an address, you know, the 192, 168, 56 uh, subnet. And then what we're doing is that's how we're going to get back and forth between them. And then what we're doing is they also have uh, external adapters. So my PC obviously has a wireless adapter. And we gave a, uh, another adapter to the, uh, the VM that's natted so he can get out to the internet. Everybody see that? So the, the point is, when you get the box, when you download it from the website, you'll have to you know, configure it, tailor it a little bit to your IP address scheme, however you want to do that. Um, and then this is just the configuration from the virtual box manager. And the, really, the only thing, this is, uh, this is the, the external adapter, how it's configured. Adapter number one, that goes to the outside world. I have that configured as NAT. And then adapter number two, which is the one we're going to be using, is uh, configured this way, right? Virtual box, right? So we're, we're really making like a, a virtual Ethernet switch that virtual box plays as. And then the, the uh, VM sits there. And it interfaces to my, makes my PC look like a, uh, I've got a virtual NIC card that talks to VirtualBox. So it looks like a, a switch, right? Uh, on Windows 10, here's my configuration. This is the Wi-Fi configuration to the external world. And then this is the VirtualBox adapter that I configured. Um, and then this is also up on the, uh, the site. but. These are the statements that should help you set up uh, the Ubuntu box, you know, make the, uh, the GUI, download the GUI, it's called GNOME, uh, configure it, uh, install pip for, for Ubuntu. Actually, you don't have to do that because it's, it's, I configured it, it's sitting out there. But if you're going to do it on your own, 
If you want to set up another VM, which I strongly suggest, just follow these steps. You'll be, you'll be good to go. And then uh, some libraries that I downloaded. All of this stuff, by the way, I didn't have to download anything for Python for Ubuntu. I mean, it comes with everything. Both versions of Python, 2.7 and 3. It comes with the Pi Crypto stuff installed, with every library we need. Now, Windows, on the other hand, um, we do need to add a few libraries if we want to use Windows. And just two I'd suggest, well, two we're going to use for this. One is called Requests, right? And one is called Pi Crypto. That's the crypto stuff, if we get to it. And then this is the spreadsheet stuff, right, that we'll use. And the way that you download, it's extremely complex. You'll never get this. The way that you get request modules is to say, pip install requests. Right? It goes out. It looks at all the versioning information. Make sure that all the associated libraries that requests needs is there. Puts it all in a package. Downloads it into your machine. Expands it into the appropriate libraries. And away you go. I mean, there is nothing to this stuff. So let's uh, jump back. Where are we here? So we're on, bring up our, our uh, deck to see where we are. So we looked at this. All right, so now we're going to do this thing called follow files. And what we want to show here is probably the most powerful aspect, one of the most powerful aspects of Python on a local machine. And that's the OS module. So the OS module lets you get into the guts of the operating system. And it doesn't matter if it's Windows, Mac, or whatever. Uh, this is what you use to do things like get the current working directory. Like, uh, suppose I want to put a file in a specific directory. I would use this. And the change chdir uh, module to do that, right? Um, what we're going to do is take just a bunch of, I, I just made this up, IP addresses and names. We're going to put them into a file. We're going to close the file. We're going to open the file for appending. Has anybody work with Python files? Anybody? It's pretty straightforward. And the reason I bring this up is, number one, when you work with networking, you're going to be working with files. But number two, there are a lot of similarities. The way that you work with networking, the way that you send packets around a network, and the way that Python handles files. They're very, very similar. So let's, uh, let's bring that up. It's called follow files, right? While I'm doing this, um, feedback time. Any feedback? Feedback? OK. We'll press ahead. So what we're going to do here is we're going to import the module, the OS module. We've got a function called get input, and we're going to be passing that something called a message, right? And we're doing a, and really, I started I tried to make this as you know, complicated as possible. All I'm doing is taking a bunch of strings, I'm concatenating them together, I'm splitting them apart. You know, I come up with one big message that I'm going to write to disk, right? So here, what we're doing in this function, and you can tell it's a function because it, it's indented. It's indented. Uh, I'm going to take whatever was ended here, and I'm going to concatenate it with the string called entered. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the user to enter something, right? Uh, he's going to put that there, and I'm going to return to whatever that value, I'm going to return it to whoever called me. That's one function. Another function that we've created here is creating output. And I'm going to print out a whole bunch of stuff, uh, ask for input. Here's my, <laughs> here, <laughs> here's my, um, my conditional where uh, I'm doing a bunch of if statements, right? And I'm using the OS path command to put together like this final version of the, the path and the, uh, the file that I want to write to. Here, when I get down here, I'm actually doing the write. 
So I'm opening a file. This is the path that I built up here. Uh, I'm opening that up, and I'm opening it for append. Any way to turn this up? <laughs> turn up the volume? Let's crank up the volume. We'll get in a shouting match next door. So, <laughs> thank you. So, um, we're going to open the file. We're going to open it for append. We're going to take that buffer that we've been writing, and we're going to kind of put it, at, when we open that file, this is an example where we spin up an instance. So that instance, uh, it's the stuff that's going to handle the reading and writing of that file. So it's going to be, we're going to reference that by the letters FP. I just made that up, right? And whenever I reference that instance, I'm going to say, hey, whatever's there, uh, write it. I'm going to write out. Then I'm going to close the file and return to whatever called me, right? Down here, I'm going to say, I'm going to get input from the user. Uh, I'm going to get uh, three inputs from the user, the IP address, the username, and the password. And what I could have done to make this easy was instead of making this a function, you know, I'm calling this function with this string, then I call it again with this string, then I call it again with this string. I could have just said, had three statements that said, you know, raw input, you know, enter your IP address, enter your username, enter your password. I just wanted to make the point about to see if you understood um, functions and how arguments get passed. Uh, are you guys okay with this? Okay. Then what we're going to do is, what we're doing here is you'll see this happening. We've got to turn it up. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, you'll see this all the time in uh, network communications, at least, and, and very often within Python. It's an infinite loop. And what I'm saying is, while true, which is always and forever, right, do all this stuff. And once I get down here, I'm going to break out of that while statement if I want to. Once I get done here, I'm going to ask the user, do you want to continue, yes or no? If he says yes, if he says yes, I'm going to just continue back in this loop again. If he says no, I'm going to execute this break. It's going to drop back down here and pass command to the operating system. <laughs> Everybody get that? Everybody on board? Everybody want to see it? Okay. Okay. All right. Woo. All right. So first, and again, I just made up what we're doing here just for the purpose of example. So let's just 1.1.1.1. One dot one dot one dot one. Uh, Vince uh, password. Okay, so uh, it wrote that file to disk, uh, and it, it told me, I'm sorry, uh, it told me where it, the current, it, it issued that OS get current working directory, and it found that it's sitting at this uh, vagrant part one subdirectory. And it says, um, do you want to use a different directory or do you want to use that one as your default? If I hit enter, it's just going to use the default one. I can change that directory. Okay? So let me just hit enter. Now it's going to say, hey, Vince, I'm going to write this thing out and I'm going to call the file file.text. Do you want to use that as the name or do you want to name it something else? Let's just use the default. So now he says, this is all the stuff I was doing with that path, that OS path command. I took, when I, I used that OS path command, what I did was I took this, and I took this, and here I'm merging them together into one path. So the program knows where to go specifically to write that file out, right? So now he's done writing. So he's asking me, I wrote it out, do you want to continue? Let's do another one. Let's say yes. So we're in that loop and we're spinning around. So we're going to go 2.2.2.2. Let's say Mary. Let's say, you know, password. All right, same thing. We'll do the same defaults and we'll end. Now let's go look and see if that's there. Uh, let's bring up. 
Hey! <laughs> and there's our file, and there's our, uh, our stuff. All right? Everybody get this? Too fast, too slow? Yes. What's that? It will overwrite an existing file because I opened it in an append mode. If I wanted to, I'm sorry, it won't. <laughs> Forget what I just said. If I, if I open, let me go to the code. If I open that file in the code, hold on. Is this our code? Let me go up to the file. Okay, here we are. So here, I'm opening the file. I'm issuing an open command. I'm giving it the path that I constructed, the directory and the file name. And, and look at this. This is called the mode. This is called the mode. And you've got any number of modes within Python. Here, I'm saying, I'm giving it an A. And an A means, hey, if the file's there, and I'm giving you something to write, just stick it on to the end. If I were to say W, and it went to open that file, it would overwrite the contents. I can open, and you can see this in some of the programs we do, I can open it for binary. So at the end of the day, everything, as we all know, is ones and zeros, right? So it has to be interpreted us for us dumb humans uh, as characters that we understand. But I can do things like I can open the binary. I can open it as a binary string and do some stuff with it. That's the way programs get written, right? Or executed or transferred across networks. There you open up uh, as, you're, as you're about to send, if you want to do a file transfer, as you're about to send that, that program, you identify it as a program, it opens up as binary and it takes the binary string and sends it across the network on the other side, that guy opens up a file for writing binary. He sucks in the string, writes it out, closes it, file transfer done. Everybody get that? All right, feedback time. <laughs> uh, what do you think? Question. Um, is there a possibility to be, debug the code, uh, to, to see uh, how the code is executing? Absolutely great, great question. Yes. Um, so there are any number, uh, like a zillion and a half, uh, what are called IDEs, Integrated Development Environments. And in fact, one, one, uh, one that I like, because it's cheap, <laughs> it's free, uh, is called PyScriptor. Uh, there's PyCharm, there's, uh, you name it, I mean, you name it. it, there's a zillion of them out there. There's, um, anybody use Eclipse? Eclipse has a whole Python thing, right? That you just download the module, you plug it in, away you go. Now they are sophisticated packages. This thing's 10 times more sophisticated than when I put out here. When you, when you get Python, it's free, right? So what are you going to get when you get something that's free? Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot of bells and whistles, right? I mean, there is a boatload of stuff that comes with this language, but in terms of additional tools, you know, they're think the thinking is, you know, you're going you're to develop your own tools, so go get them yourself, right? But that being said, there's a very cool way to do exactly what you were asking. Let's, um, let's see if we can reproduce it. I can get this thing to shut down. Uh, let's, let's go into here and uh, let's do this. I think I just messed it up. Did I? No. Let's go here. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm inside this function. And again, when a function executes, it's on its own little world, right? So if you stop the program somewhere down in the regular execution, um, you're not going to be able to see what was going on inside that function. Now, there is a tool that's called uh, locals and globals. 
And what that will do is, when you go into that function, or you go into your program in general, that's going to hit that statement, and it will dump everything that's associated with that, that local environment, right? So let me print one here, and I'll print one down in the main program uh, before I go here. All right, so let's run this and watch it blow up. So there you go. We hit our first, that, it's a dump of every variable that, uh, the state of every variable that's in that function. So you'll see a whole bunch of you know, rigmarole in here that doesn't make any sense. But one thing you will be able to see is um, anything that we've entered in any of the variables, if, depending on where you put that local statement, you'll be able to see the contents of what that is, what's in there, right? Let me get a better example. There's where we're calling get input. Um, name and uh, does, this doesn't show you a lot. Let me uh, let me go to the next one. One, uh, whatever, name, password, uh, enter, enter. Oh, it didn't print out the next one. Oh, yes, it did. Okay, so. This is the second, sometimes there's a lot of stuff, sometimes there's not a lot of stuff, right? So here, we, we printed out the locals, and you can see, there's what I entered, right? Everybody see that? Now there's a super duper version called globals that will do this, right? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's do this. Let's do print globals. Okay, and we'll run it again. And this, by the way, this is everything. See the big dump? It's time we got a whole bunch of stuff. And that is, this is everything. This <laughs> is everything. Everything that's going on in this program. Um, at this point in time where I put that global statement, right? Um, I'm right at the point where I'm about to, you know, uh, print, ask for an IP address. But all the variables are in here. Not only that, but all the modules that are getting called. And it actually brings up a good, good point, a great point. Whoever asked that question, somebody over there or whatever, uh, let me break out of this. There's a breakout. Uh, what I did was, if you want to see, we're going to talk about objects in a minute, what an object is. But the most common thing I hear about from people who are kind of new to it is, uh, are, you're talking about spinning up objects. How do I look what's inside that object, right? And you, uh, sometimes you almost have to take it on faith that this is happening. But there is a way to show the guts. Again, Python's very open uh, kind of platform. So there is a way to show the guts of everything that's in a module, that you, a library that you load in, right? So let's do that. We're going to be working with sockets, so let's just do import. Oh, import. Let's spell it right. So I've just gone out to the Python library and pulled in the socket communication module. Now, wouldn't it be nice to be able to look inside that and see what is there? Okay, well, let's do that. It's called D-I-R, S-O-C-K-E-T. So it's called D-I-R, and watch. This is everything that's inside that module that got loaded. All this big letter stuff, this capital letters, they're all variables. So if you were to go inside this file and look for you know, timeout, uh, tipsy con timeout, you would see a number next to it, right? That's how, you know, you can, that's how you get these. When we set up a socket, we're going to be using some of these to identify that socket. Down here are some of the command, quote unquote, commands that came with that module, right? 
So uh, like here, we're going to be using a get address info. That's actually a method. It's called a method. Really, a method is nothing more than a function. The function we just talked about is essentially the same thing. So when you spin up that object the, you know, from the socket library, Python is going to take a subset. It's not going to take the whole thing. It's going to take a subset of these things and spin them off into basically what amounts to a communications object. Everybody get that? That's most, about the most difficult thing you're going to have to understand with this, right? Seriously, you guys good with it? So the earlier question about debugging, uh, you went, yeah, thanks for asking that. <laughs> Didn't mean to go off on a tangent. Um, when Eclipse and when PyScripter and when, you know, the rest of those super, super, you know, IDE development environments, when they're running and when they're trying to debug for you, they do a whole lot of stuff. It's well worth getting it. But when they're doing all that stuff, they're using that. They're using locals. They're, they're going through it for you. They're presenting it in a, a you know, a palatable way. Uh, they're, you know, they're doing this. They're dumping stuff out. They do a lot more for you. This is just the uh, El Cheapo version of uh, you know, our IDE. Everybody good? We good? Uh, so where are we? Get back to the, uh, we did this file. I think we're about to finally, oh, whatever. I think we're about to finally get into the good stuff. Listing, you can look at that later. Uh, okay, well, let's, let's look at uh, file info, because we're probably going to need to look at that. Let's go to uh, follow file info, right? Where are you? Okay. Nothing better than having your VM hang when you're doing a demo. Let me restart it. Okay, feedback time. What do you, <laughs> what do you guys think so far? What do you want to see? Can we, uh, I mean, while this is coming up, let me show you a couple things, um, if this ever comes up. Um, oh, yeah, all right, it's coming up. So, again, we've been talking about uh, a lot of the stuff that Python comes with. One of the cool things that it comes with is a, um, a little mini web server, right? So, the way that you execute that is, I just have a bat file. The way that you execute it is, uh, again, this is part of the Python library, comes with it. You... Uh, Execute Python, this is the program. This is the port number that you want Python to reserve on your adapter. Anybody talking to that port number, anybody coming in on that port number, is going to get served as a web client. So let's bring up, uh, let's go to see if our Ubuntu box has come up. Please come up. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's just bring, if this ever comes back up. We bring up a web browser. And let's go to 68. Dot, uh, what's my number? 56.1. And we're going to go to colon, what was it, 8013. We're going to take port 8013. Okay? We're going to say. Okay, so this is the most important thing that you need to take away from this discussion today, and that is the Philadelphia Eagles football fight song. It's going to be a quiz at the end of this. This was a snowball game, greatest game ever played, seriously. Awesome. Um, what we did there was we went in that directory. Python is running the, the server, the HTTP server. If we reserved a port. It's running now. I came in with my browser and I said, I want that port. 
it, and it went in, and Python searched through that directory, and it said if it found a, an index.html, or in this case, eagles.html, um, it, it served that page. Now, why are we doing this? I know we all love the eagles, but do we love them that much? The real value of this thing, I think this is the one, is we can watch in background as we're building these screens all the interaction between, you know, that, that server, and I don't think this is a session, unless I killed it. That was, that was 12. We should be able to see all the interactions between that page, I don't know why it didn't do this, between that page, all the rest calls that were executed between that page and the server. In this case, we're seeing a bunch of rest gets from this address, that's my Ubuntu server, my Ubuntu client. And oops, we got a 404, what is that about, right? Well, it's tied to this, it helps you build uh, some pretty robust um, services, right? The other thing that you can do with it is uh, you should be able to go into the port itself, into the directory itself. And I'm having problems with my super duper, oh, you know what? Always want to make sure the firewall is off. Uh, let's try this again. Although I might have hung that. Okay. Here, what I did was I just asked for the port. I didn't, if you notice, I didn't put an eagles.html uh, file on the end of it, right? Just asked for the port. Now it's giving me the directory listings. And the cool thing about this is I can go in and, and pull them up, right? Like, let's look at the bat file that I launched earlier. There's the contents of the bat file, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can put my listings in here, whatever. So if I give it the port number and the address only, it'll give me the files in that directory. It'll serve me those files. If I give it an HTML, it'll serve me that page. It's a really handy tool. And by the way, this is the uh, utility we're going to use for our, eight, our XML RPC server, because all Python does is take this thing and bolt uh, the XML RPC server on top of it, right? And again, all this is, if you want to learn how to write or build your own uh, web server, code's right there. All right, moving right along. Uh, where are we? Okay, we looked at that. Oh, we didn't look at that. Follow files. Let's look at follow files. So we're, here we're going to pull some information. I hope, part one. Where's follow file? There we go. Here what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're just going to dump out a whole bunch of stuff using that OS module and the time module. We're going to pull in two libraries and we're going to dump a whole bunch of stuff on this, uh, on this system. Let me just run it here. Okay, so what's the file name? Uh, where are we, first off? I think it's, uh, let's say, I think I put, okay. Uh, let me see what, OS, let's do this. We need to find out where we are. OS, let's say uh, os.get uh, current working directory. Where are we? Okay, we're in Vagrant part one. Let's see what files are in Vagrant part one. Uh, you know what? Let's do this. Let's see if this works. Let's do um, os.change directory to uh, this, home dot vagrant now let's see where we are make sure it did that 
And I'm not sure this will this will work, but let's let's give it a shot. Uh, I won't because I'm going to execute this separately. But you can see how I how I um, I ran this. Let's just let's just look inside and see what files are there. Uh, where am I? Home part one. Uh, let's just look at file. Okay, let's run this guy. File name, file, the one we just created. There you go. Um, immediately went out, pulled in the size of the file in terms of bytes, and then gave me this, a timestamp. It's unintelligible, right? Well, that's where those time modules come in. What we're doing here is we're converting them into human-readable stuff, very valuable stuff. This is how you find out when it was at last accessed, who modified it, right? When it was created, right? So, you know, part of the critical thing to find out who's been messing with my stuff. All right. <laughs> Feedback time. Anybody want to drink? Uh, is this hitting the mark, not hitting the mark? What do you guys think? Do you want to speed it up or slow it down? Or stay where we are? Thumbs up if you want to stay where we are. Thumbs down if you want to speed it up. Speed it up. Three. Okay, we'll speed it up. Um, get off the files thing. Uh, let's look at uh, just a quick encryption. Good feedback, by the way. Uh, honestly, thank you for, for giving that. I personally don't know where you guys, how comfortable you are with this stuff, so um, we want to do encryption, right? Like quote-unquote encryption. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not use this as encryption. It is, it's the lowest slimiest form of encryption. It's not even encryption. Um, it's encoding. Uh, it's based on this thing called the Caesar cipher. A zillion years ago when Caesar was running around, he would send out his battle, his battle plans and he would write them down. And what he would do would be, for every letter that he wrote, he would shift it down in their alphabet three places, right? Well, that was effective because nobody could read back then, right? So they thought it was some gibberish. So along comes this super, super imaginative, creative person that says, hey, instead of three places, let's shift down 13. And hence, you have the rot 13 cipher. Instead of three, we, we shift down 13. If we're at the end of the alphabet, we shift around, right? So how hard is that to crack? That is like a, a hacker's dream because it generates all kinds of patterns, the worst thing that you can have in any kind of cryptographic situation. A repeating thing is, is a disaster. So don't, unless you wanna like use it to hide the Christmas list from the kids, don't use this, don't rely on it. But anyway, we're, we're basically doing the same thing, we're creating a function, we're getting input from the user. Uh, we're the same function, create output, you saw this before, we're letting you choose the directory, on and on and on. Here's the, where we got all the input from the user. Same program. Now, let's do the very ugly encoding of ROT13. And very complex. All we have to do <laughs> is give it the buffer and tell it what we, how we want it encoded. And we tell it, go encode. Hey, codex, pull in the codec library. Hey, codec library, I want you to execute this method called encode. And encode is going to expect to get some kind of buffer and the encoding type that you want it, you're expecting it to do. In this case, ROT13. So it's going to execute, and it's going to put whatever it passes back, that encrypted string, into this variable. Then we're going to, we're going to write it out to the file. Everybody see that? Then we're going to loop around. It's our same program, just a little bit different. So let's run that. Uh, one, whatever, you know, Jack, 
Uh, pass. Keep it, keep it. Yes. Let's say uh, whatever. Uh, you know, one, two, three. Okay. Let's enter, enter, and then no. Okay, let's look at the file. And now we did an append on that file, right? And we should see a lot of stuff. And there it is. There was our original stuff that we opened the file and we wrote to. And then look at this. This is ugly. And the reason it's ugly, look at, it's not encrypting numbers. It ignores numbers completely. And it, it gives you all kinds of patterns. If you do this enough time, you're going to be able to figure out that, hey, <laughs> this is rot 13, which is it's rotation 13. So now let's decode it. Uh, let's bring up our handy dandy decoder. Display, follow, decrypt. So the decryption is incredibly difficult, just as difficult as the encryption. Guess what's going to happen? Exact opposite of what happened going in. And here we go. Here we say, uh, actually, we're passing a, to a function somewhere up here. Here. All right. Sorry. So we're going to pass it into this function called decode entries. And we're going to do the exact opposite. Instead of this time saying encode, we're going to say decode. And we're going to give it rot 13. OK? Let's run. Uh, directory to write for, let's just do the default. I think we kept it in the default, right? All right, there you go. So it pulled in the file, the first one. Uh, this is the decoded, the encoded name was, remember the first two entries weren't uh, encrypted. Let's, let's just continue down. Mary, skip that. And there's the third one, which is uh, our AN, ZR, whatever, whatever, whatever. Let's just bring this up. Make sure. Where's my file? Handler. There we go. So let's look at that. Uh, CLNNF, whatever, whatever, whatever. Let's look at this output. So, where was that screen? Okay. Here's our screen. Here's our file. Uh, let's find name, pass. Username is I-V-A-N, whatever, whatever. Actually, it entered a bunch of junk. Yeah, there's CNFF, CNFF. Um, it's actually trying to decode the, the um, non-encoded stuff. There's Jack. Yeah. WNPX, WNPX, CNFF. Next one will be, you know, what it was and what it is, right? RYYRA234, LN234. What's that? The file is open. Absolutely. Is, is that a problem? It, it's still spinning through the file. We're not doing anything destructive to it. We're pulling stuff out. So you, you can do that. It's not a good practice. You're absolutely right. Uh, in this case, it's just a simple text file that you know, we open for append. We're going to throw this thing away anyway. So we don't care if it gets disrupted or, or messed up. But you can do that, if that makes sense. All right, so I think we're out of uh, that. Let's jump into, see if we can jump into sockets here. All right, so here's the network communication piece. So, uh, you know, this is what we get all spun up about, right? The communications network between devices. And we talked about this earlier. 
The applications guys rub their hands, wipe their hands at a certain point. We wipe our hands at where, where the network meets the adapter, but there's a gray area in between. So what we want to do here, excuse me, this is basically our stack, um, a typical stack, right? And it's a bad design, but you know, a bad drawing. But here's the NIC card, the layer one stuff. We're clocking bits on the wire and off the wire, putting into buffers. Device drivers, C and assembly language stuff, that's what goes on down there. And we have our IP, we got TCP, UDP, and they typically communicate with quote unquote higher level protocols by way of ports or sockets, right? Then you have your higher layer protocols, HTTP, right? And above that, you've got protocols like XML RPC, you've got browsers, you've got, you know, APIC, they're using what's called REST to talk down to the, these lower layers. And each layer, everybody knows the OSI reference model, right? It doesn't really exist, right? It's just a, it's a concept. But it says everybody's responsible for their own thing. You get, your, you get your job and you do it. If you're in the presentation layer, you better be able to decode uh, strings of data. If you're in the network layer, you better, be, you better be able to segment messages and make sure there's retransmission, all that kind of stuff. Well. <clears throat> The same thing is going on in here. These upper layer protocols are using simplistic, uh, very simple APIs to talk down, to pass things down into these lower layer uh, entities, right? And that's where this library, the socket library, comes into play. That's where it's very powerful. I can use Python at any one of these layers, right? They all operate the same way. I can use Python to go uh, talk REST, pure REST. I can use it for HTTP. I can use it as an SSL connection, um, on and on and on. So that's what we're going to do. So what's the first thing, before we start setting up connections and, and sending packets and frames? So, <laughs> so um, where were we? Oh, yeah. So what can you get before you even start with, you know, uh, setting up network connections and sockets and all that kind of stuff? Like, I can do a DIR and get a whole directory listing from my machine. Can I do something simple like that? Well, yes, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and part of the stuff that you can get is what we just showed you with that, you know, when we imported that socket module and did the DIR on socket, right? These are some of the methods or functions that allow you to pull information from your communication stack, right? So let's, uh, let's look at that. Let's look at a couple of these. <coughs> Where am I? There we go. Let's look at some of these utilities that allow us to go in, close down some of these, pull this. All right, let's open up. We've got uh, one that has a whole bunch of examples here. Encrypt. There we go, follow sockets. Okay, so what we're doing, if you recall, bring this up. Uh, S-O-C-K-E-T. We did the D-I-R. We want to look inside socket. D-I-R, spell it right. K-E-T. Okay, so you'll notice, again, we dump out the whole library. There's, notice these functions. Get host name, uh, has IPv6, uh, get name info, get proto by, by uh, name, get service by name. These are all utilities, functions that have been built that will go in and query the communication stack, right? So let's look at some of them. 
um, so we have a program. The, the first thing we want to see is, does this computer have a TCP IP v6 stack? And to query that, you import socket. You say, hey, socket, uh, what is this value? If it comes back as true, then it means you've got a v6 stack. Uh, here I'm saying, hey, socket, get host by name. And you can see down in here somewhere, get host by name. Uh, this is the function or the method that I'm going to call that lives within the socket module. And what it's going to do is going to return the name of this machine. Then we're going to ask another uh, method to give me the fully qualified domain name for this machine. Then we're going to ask it, give me some extended information, blah, 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 on down. I'm going to translate that into the host IP address. Uh, what addresses can you see on this machine? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to do it for another machine. So let's, um, let's run this. So first thing that we did was, if you recall, it's that if statement. Do we have an IP6 statement, uh, IP6 stack? And it says yes. It came back as true. Now, it doesn't do anything with that stack. It just tells you that it's there, right? Then we say we get our machine name. In this case, it's the Ubuntu image. It's called Trusty64, the default name. We said the uh, FQDN, it's, you know, it, normally if it's one, my machine, it would be my machine name, you know, dot Cisco dot com or whatever, right? Uh, what's my IP address? 10.0.215. Well, that's not the address that we were using to get back and forth between the VM and my Windows machine, right? What's going on there? Hazard a guess? It's using the first adapter that it has preference for, right? It's going to use that. And that's a gotcha. Sometimes when we're doing this communication stuff, we're in some uh, instances, we're going to have to bind, we're going to bind our program to an IP address. And if we bind it to the preferred, if we just say, give me anything, don't, I don't want to stipulate what the IP address is. There's a way to just say, you know, uh, blanks. If we say that, it's going to go out and grab the first IP address that it has pre preference for. And if we're expecting, <laughs> that keynote address has got to be great. I'm kind of missing that. Um, if we're expecting to use 196, 168, you know, 56.101, we're in for a, a long night, right? Uh, here's where we're dumping anything that we can find. There's a little list inside this, this uh, communication stack. And it's giving me the machine name. If this machine had an alias, that would be the alias. And then all of the IP addresses that it can find. In this case, it returned two. Gave me the uh, fully qualified domain name. Here it's only trusty64. It, it went through this list, and it's the way you can look at it, and found two entries. Um, and again, that, that's the point about this message. It's the preferred adapter it's going to go to. If you don't spe specify the IP address, it's just going to pick one for you. So let's, let's enter um, www.cisco.com. And it went out. It found you know, 104, 122, 84, 150. So let's look at that. 104. 104.122.84.150. And there you go. It found uh, the CDN that we use, that one of the CDNs that Cisco uses for content. Looked at its alias. It could only identify one address, right? So obviously, Cisco pays for more than one IP address, but that's the only one it could find, OK? So uh, that's how you pull information. Let's uh, look at our next. Let's look at UDP, uh, a simple UDP message passing. Uh, do we want to go into sockets? Let's go into sockets. So what is a socket? A anybody want to hazard a guess? Or anybody know? Sorry? It's exactly right. It doesn't matter if it's exactly right. It is the IP address coupled with the port that you're using, right? Uh, very important. That's called a socket name. Right? So it's the IP address and the port. And we can specify whatever we want. If it's, if it's mail, I think it's like 
IP address 25, it's FTP, it's 21 and 22, whatever, whatever, right? So it's just a concept, right? It's a way of gluing things together. So I'm not going to go into that. Just a brief object-oriented uh, thing that we have to talk about. When we're doing any kind of communications, uh, and we're using this library or any language library, we have to answer five questions. The first one is, OK, well, what, what kind of network do you want to use? Um, do you want to use IPv6 or IPv4? Uh, it used to be, in the olden days, you would have multiple communication stacks on your machine. SNA, DECnet, you know, uh, Apple Talk, uh, on and on and on. IPv4, Novell. So uh, when you see, that's where you, when we talk about address family, you'll see an AF underscore INET. That means I want to use the IPv4 stack. Um, then we want to find out what kind of connection do we want. Do we want connectionless UDP? Connectionless UDP? Or do we want connection-oriented stream service? UDP, it's a what? It's a datagram service, right? So the Python library calls that dgram. If I want to use TCP, I say stream, because what is TCP? It's a streaming protocol, right? We're not sending out uh, packets. We're sending out streams of bytes, right? This is not so much uh, important. I'll go back to this in a second. We need to answer what kind of IP address to use and what TC UDP and, and uh, TCP port number. Now, this question here, what kind of protocol do I need? Usually, that gets answered when you answer these two and this, right? So you rarely see that. So let's look at some code. What we're going to talk about now is so what's a socket object. Here is the five, essentially, uh, two of the five questions that we just answered when we make this statement. First, we import the socket library. And then what we say is, we say this. Retrieve the socket library. Um, and within that socket library, there's another module called socket. Right? Within that socket module, I want to pass these parameters. The question number one was, you know, what protocol stack do I want? Next one is, what kind of uh, communications method do I want, UDP or TCP? Then I want to do something called spinning up a socket object. Now, anyone want to hazard a guess of what the heck that means? So when we spin up a so socket object, we usually have, we sh let's start out with a client. So we import the socket library. We you know, do our little questionnaire on the identifying the stack and the type of communication session that we want. And then we do this. We, we say, hey, socket library, this is what I want. I want you to pull in everything associated with this and this, all the stuff, all the variables, all the methods, anything associated with what I just gave you here, and stuff it into this object that I just arbitrarily called C. You can call it anything you want. You can call it beer. You can call it keynote speaker, anything you want, right? I just happen to call it C. So what does that mean? We spin up an object. Well, remember we talked about um, when we spin up an object or we instantiate an object, we take a subset of everything that's in the socket library that we identify and we stuff it into that object. So now, going forward from this point on, that socket object is going to only be able to deal with those individual elements, right? Everybody get that? Good? So. What does this particular socket object do? And this is true of anything in an object-oriented language. When you do an object-oriented language, you're, you're identifying what you want to take, and it's pulling a subset of that stuff out, and it's putting it into an object that that object's going to handle. So some of the things that this handles is the communication stuff, right? Uh, you know, setting up the session, tearing it down, fragmenting, reassembling, if, it, if it's a stream protocol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then, from the client side, once we've got that uh, communications object spun up, 
we do a connect. And we say, hey, now that everything that is associated with what we just asked is put in this socket object, one of those methods we know that's in there is called connect. Right? It's in here. So we're going to issue a connect. We're going to say, hey, you, there's a connect in here. I want you to go take this IP address and this socket and go out and connect to it. Everybody get that? Good. On the server side, we're going to import the socket. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to say, hey, take the library, give me a subset of the stuff, and put it into that object. Right? Spin up an object. Then we're going to say, I didn't have to do this. This was just, uh, this is just fancy stuff. This is just us saying, hey, socket library, go get the um, IP address and put it in this, this uh, variable, right? Uh, we could have just, it's looking for a string, so we could have just given it a hard-coded IP address. But after that, what we're going to do, what the server's going to do, is he's going to do a bind. This is where we tie the server into that IP address, right? We're giving it an IP address and a port number. This could be anything we make up. This has to be an integer. This has to be a string. If I give it nothing, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So we're bound to the interface, right? We're bound to the IP. And we're not bound to the physical interface. We're bound to the IP address represented in that stack. So now uh, we got the address. Here are bind options. Here are the options we were just talking about. I can say bind on anything. Just listen to anything that comes in. But what that's going to do is it's going to pick its preferred adapter and accept any connection coming in from that adapter. If you've got multiple adapters in your machine, then you're only going to hear from that preferred adapter. This says, give me the, uh, the loopback interface, the, the local uh, IP address, 127.000. This is a specific IP address, right? So really anything coming in for this port is going to be identified by that, that IP address. Everybody get it? We talked about this, the, the bind. Be careful of that. So um, then on the server side, what we're going to do is we're going to have a bunch of connection requests coming in. So what we're going to do is issue a listen, what's called a listen. And what it's going to say is, I will take up to five outstanding connection, inbound connection requests. In this case, I just picked the number five. And what he'll do is, he'll service up to five connects, clients connecting to him. And on the sixth one, he'll say, nope, can't, can't handle it, right? Now this is where we get it, start getting into the realm of performance tuning and the guts of certain operating systems. They work differently. And we'll, we'll run up against this in a minute. He builds a table, and then what he does is he goes into this loop. He spins into this loop, and he says, for this, this object, this socket object, accept, there's a little routine inside that object that handles accepting con inbound connections. The TCP three-way handshake, we all know that, right? It sets that up. It handles all that stuff. That's this guy. He says, oh, hey, I got an inbound connection request. Return the IP address of who called me and spin up a socket object that represents that. Right? Does everybody see this? Seriously, because uh, this is like the heart of the whole. The client, he does a connect. He sends it in. Right? He gets this uh, connection request. He accepts it. Right? He accepts the request. He puts it in his table. Here's the socket name. Right? He spins up his socket object, puts it in his table with this address. And now this guy is going to handle all the low level, lower level communications junk that goes on. He's not going to bother himself with it. Now, it's important to note at this point, he got, the server got, a connection, inbound connection request, this stuff down in here, that's just going to handle that particular, it's going to be all the stuff associated with what that particular connection wants to do. Like if he wants to do a file transfer, this will be all the file transfer stuff down in here. But what happens is, as soon as the, the server gets, it makes that accept, 
and hands it off to that client object, he goes back to listening. He pulls one, one off the, he adds one to the availability, and he just goes back and listens again. That's why when you do a net stat, you'll see a state of listening. This is exactly what's happening. There's one part of this server that's sitting there just listening for, waiting for accepting, uh, to accept connection requests. And the other part, once it gets it, it spins this stuff off, it does its thing, away it goes. Right? So you do something, you close the connection, and it goes away. Now, over the course of time, you know, this server is going to have a boatload of objects loaded up, right? All running, servicing different connection requests. But at the end of the day, in this case, I've got three objects representing three connections. Um, they're all going to be doing this stuff down here, file transfer or whatever. Okay? Everybody see that? So if you do, I think that's where we can get into some code. Okay, good. Let's, let's actually run some UDP stuff. The El Cheapo. What's the password? Dagrant, right? <laughs> nice. V A G R A N T. My caps are not on. May have to reboot this box. V A G R A N T. Or my keyboard is messed up. Yeah, something's wrong. V A G R. All right, reboot time. All right. I think it's my keyboard. Uh, any questions, thoughts, comments, hysterical laughter? This is a loud keynote speaker. Want to talk about that? <clears throat> what do you guys think? Feedback? Thumbs up, down, slower, faster? E A G R A N T. <laughs> All right, so where were we again? Uh, honestly, I think it is my keyboard. I, 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 this thing is beat to heck. Um, but you will find out when you download the OVA. All right, so let's stand up. Uh, let's, do, let's bring up the client and look at that first. Uh, where are we? Socket scan. Oh, no, you know what? We didn't do any of this. We didn't do ping. We didn't do socket example. Let's run our socket examples. Or did we? Yeah, we did this. Uh, let's do a port scan real quick. All we're going to do here is we're going to go into the adapter, and we're going we're to try to connect to every port associated with an IP address. So, you know, 23, you know, whatever. What I'm doing here is I'm just coming in and I'm going to select a range of ports starting at port 52 going up to 500. I'm going to say, hey, take 52 and port it in, in this variable, port. Then I'm going to try to connect to it. And if, that, if there is no port 52, it's going to blow up. So that's the point of this try and accept statement. If it doesn't connect, it means it's not on, obviously, right? So it's going to fail, and it'll drop into this piece here that says print out just a little plus sign, right? And it's going to go to 53, 54, 55, 56. So let's um, 192.168.56.101. And there you go. Uh, I found two services on TCP 111. There definitely is something wrong with this. 
All right. Everybody get that? So that's um, us querying the local port. Let's bring up UDP. Oh, let's bring up ping, actually. And actually, let's bring that up on Windows first. Uh, we're going to say open to ping. So this is an example of using the OS module to call programs, other programs, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to come in. We're going to, first, we're going to identify what operating system we're running on. And the reason we need to do that is ping operates differently on Linux than it does on Windows, right? So what we'll do here is we'll say is we're going to query the OS module and say if the name is NT, it means Windows. If the name is POSIX, it means some kind of Linux operating system we're running on. So if it's, if it's Windows, go execute this system call that then issues a ping to the host name, to that variable in host name, right? We're going to come down through here. If it's Linux, on the other hand, if it's POSIX, we're going to have to capture that to a file, right? And recall that, that ping on Linux keeps pinging. So we're going to limit it to four, right? So let's do it on this first. And you'll see it execute. Um, Let's do www. So it brings up the DOS emulator, pings, drops away, and says that it's responding because it returned a zero, which is the return code. So we'll say yes. We could do it again. So let's, let's do it on, on Linux, on Ubuntu. Uh, am I on Ubuntu? No, that's the C. This is the guy. So let's, um, we're doing the exact same thing. We're coming in here and we're saying, we're testing for NT or POSIX. We're going to hit this and we're going to just ping, but we're going to um, redirect it to a file called ping file in our current working directory. So let's run. Let's do www.cisco.com. It's capturing, bang, 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 no. Let's go look at, I think it's in part one. I think I called it ping file, yeah, there we go. And there's the, the ping, right? So that's just an example of calling and executing uh, a program from the OS, uh, which is, it's going to happen a lot when you're talking about networking. So let's go into, uh, let's, finally do the UDP stuff. And that'll be in the UDP library. We're going to bring up the client first. Let's do UDP client. And here, um, all we're doing is, it's very, very straightforward. All we're doing is, we know what goes on here, right? We're spinning up an object. It's going to have a subset of all the library functions going to be called C. Again, you can call it anything you want. Here is just an example of the ability to set options on that, you know, adapter. In this case, I'm saying, you know, I'm going to use a socket interface and it's going to be all broadcast, right? I could set socket timeout values, all kinds of stuff. Here, I'm going to bind not to, I'm going to bind to any IP address that I find and we're going to send out, I'm going to bind it to this port, right? 5678. And then he's just going to sit there waiting, right? He's going to do a receive. And here he's saying, receive up to 1024 bytes of information, right? Uh, and now this is where we get into the heart of like performance tuning, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're, this is connectionless, right? So it's going to send out packets. And if, it, if you don't get it, it doesn't care. If it drops, it doesn't care. It's not going to retransmit. But if you're running a stream protocol like TCP, it absolutely is going to stream out bytes and keep going. But that is all dependent on the underlying operating system. Are your transmit and receive buffers full? Right? 
If they are, TCP is going to back off, not just on the communications algorithm, but it's going, to, it's going to back up. And if you've issued a send on that TCP socket, and your, your lower level NIC cards are backed up, it's not going to tell you anything. It's just going to wait. You're going to be sitting there blocking while that thing is trying to clear. That's where the programmer comes in and says, hey, your network stinks. And you go back to the programmer and say, hey, your program stinks, right? This is where you get this, again, this whole gray area. So let me do this. Let me bind to a specific IP address. Um, 192.168.56.101. I'm going to sit there. And I'm going to wait on this guy. OK, now let me make sure my, uh, my gateway, or my, uh, I'm sorry, my firewall should be off. Let's go to Windows. Let's go to the UDP stuff. Let me do a UDP server. OK, and in this case, I just called it. I, it doesn't have to, you know, it's just what I call it. I just call this server. But in this case, he's going to send this out on a broadcast address. Uh, and we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, he's, he's putting this string. He's assigning this string to this variable. And he's saying, send to anything in this variable, which happens to be broadcast and port. Right? It's all right. Is what you guys are looking for? Let's see if this works. So he's sending. And we are not picking up. Let me do this. Change that back. OK, so <clears throat> we just did an accept on any IP address. And you can see on the server side, where's my UDP shell? He's just he's continuing to ping. He's continuing to send out packets. If you guys have this up and running, you should be able to get these packets right now. Here I just did one, and then I exited. So let's run it again. He sent a hello world. I picked it up. I got it again, and this will go on all night. Now, a variation, everybody see that? Is everybody comfortable with this? You understand what's going on? Could you do this? Could you take this code and stand it up and run it? I don't think, <laughs> I don't think right now. Uh, but let's do this. Let's go up a game, step up here, and do Let's do a UDP countdown server. Uh, let's just go to UDP. Let's do our, let's do a client again from this side. Let me just run this and we'll explain it a little bit later. If you notice what's happening here, what we did was, in this version, we did the exact same thing we did in the last version, only we decoded. We're decoding any stream that we want. And what's happening is, that, that server on the other side is still sending out packets. So this guy is coming in and trying to decode what is a valid message. So let's stop that server on the far side. We can find them. All right. And you'll see, notice how we shut that down and we still got a message stream, right? That's the in flight messages. 
So now let us do, let's do the countdown server. What are we running here? Is this the uh, follow ping? Okay. Let me, I'm going to run the, um, open this guy, open UDP, countdown server. Let me execute. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that went into this, but uh, including date and time routines, I'm just really doing this. Um, Dot one. Dot one. Okay, so notice we're encrypting a message that's going out using that crappy uh, ROT13. And on the Ubuntu side, it's our countdown server for the Philadelphia Eagles' first kickoff game of the new season. We only have 28 weeks, three days, and some hours and some minutes left. But you get the point, you know, you could use this as, you know, some kind of message server, you know, whatever. It's very simple. Again, broadcasts any kind of firewalls. It hits a, a router, whatever. It's, it's going to, it's UDP. So let's step up our game and start talking TCP. What do you guys think, first off? Starting to dwindle. Is our attention span starting to dwindle? Keep going. We're at 515. Are you guys good with keep going? Okay. All right. Let's, um, let's fire up a simple TCP server connection. Uh, and let me just blast through this real quick. We went through this. Just to show you what we're going to talk about. We're not going to, we just showed you that We're, now we're moving on to the other side of that stack, the stream, the connection-oriented stuff. So we've got like 10 examples here. And what we want to do is start from the bottom and work our way up. What we want to do is do that, um, show you a function, a very, very powerful function uh, called OS walk. And what that will do is it will go down through a directory, a tree, from whatever level you tell it to start at, it will parse all the way down through that tree, and it will display, it will give you back all the subdirectories that it finds, all the files in that directory, and then it'll go through in each of those subdirectories and start searching. And you can do that from the top of the root all the way down or from the bottom up, right? Then what we want to do is uh, we want to use it to find a particular file that's sitting somewhere in a uh, TCP server, right? Or uh, somewhere on a, a disk. Then what we want to do is just show a simple TCP client and server connection, sending a message back and forth. Then what we want to do is we want to take, step up that game, and we want to do a file transfer. We want to take the client, send a message to the server to give me a particular file, have that server take that file and send it back to the client. Then what we want to do is combine everything. We want to take that OS walk function, we want to put it into the server, and we want to take that client, and we want to go to that server, have it look it up internally, and send that file back. Is that what you guys want to see? Yes? Or do you want us to split some of that or move forward, move back? What do you want? Keep going the whole thing? The whole schmagiggy. We'll give you your money's worth. All right, so let's go back to our Ubuntu server. Uh, let's do, the first one that we're going to do is open, and where are we? We need to go to uh, UD, uh, TCP. Again, you'll find this on the repository, so let's do uh, OS walk. Here what we're doing is we're going to take input from the user. We're going to say, give, it, you know, give us a directory. And we're going to say, here, he's going to return a string. And he's going to put it in this variable. And we're going to hit our first if statement. And what this is saying is, 
if, if I just hit enter, this variable is going to get a null value. It's going to be empty, right? So I'm going to drop into this first if statement, and I'm going to say, if I entered something, something will be there, right? But if I didn't, it will be empty, right? So if, uh, if there's something there, this will have a value. This will be true. What I'm testing for here, though, is I'm saying, if this is not, if there's a null value in here, just go get the current working directory and put that string in the start directory. Everybody get that? If he did enter something, this is it's going to fall through to here. Um, he's going to print out the, the uh, start directory. Uh, and then he's going to execute this OS walk. And that's going to say, here's where we want to start from. And he's going to say, all right, if I put in the root, for example, let's start at the root. And he's going to return in this order. He's going to give me the root. He's going to give me the directory that he found and all the files in that directory. Right? I'm going to print out the root. Then I'm going to print out the length, the number of directories that I found. I'm going to print out the directories themselves. Um, then I'm going to print out the length, the number of files that I found, and the listing of all those files. Right? Then we're going to say, uh, what we're going to do is we're looking for a particular file. So I'm going to say, uh, the last entry in this file, here, whatever you got in here, every time I'm through this loop, I'm going to say, whatever you got in here right now, if this equals the name that I entered in the, the console, then print it out. If it doesn't, keep going. Print it out and then break. Everybody see that? Everybody all right with this? See a lot of tired faces. All right, so let's do it from the root uh, home. This isn't really a good one, but so this is kind of boring. Let's, let's get a better one, actually. Uh, oh, I should shut down the server. <laughs> uh, this will be a better one. Bear with me. Let's go to uh, UDP. Go into the UDP library, and I want to look at, what am I looking at? Oh, the oh, TCP, not UDP. Go into our TCP directory. I want to uh, OS walk. And let's just run. It's the exact same code. It's just on Windows. There's more junk in there. Uh, run. Let's do, um, let's do C, users, uh, just to save some time, C, Kelly, and then Python. So there we go. We went in, and we, we spared a little time. This can get tedious. There's the root that we started from. There's our 13 subdirectories that we found. And then here's the list of files. We found 89 files in that directory. And if we want, I mean, we can go forever on this. We can keep looping and looping. So forget network programming. This is a great way to go find files. Um, the OS module has copy utilities, has all kinds of stuff that you can you base off this, right? Very handy. We're just going to use it. And this is the whole purpose of this follow along, is to use these, build these little routines and then add them into larger and larger uh, projects, right? Right? Right. So uh, let's do our next one. Uh, file find. So on this, uh, we'll run this guy. And here's where we're actually going to go looking for a file. And I have a file out there called Hamlet. Dot text. Uh, and I'm just going to actually, I need to search from the root. Actually, let me do it from home. Save a little time. 
you know, when I did this the last time, uh, it actually went into the trash folder and pulled out an old version, so you got to be careful. All right, and there you go. It went in, and let me show you. Uh, let me bring up a console. There's Hamlet, right, his famous soliloquy. And then uh, what we did was we found him, right? We started out at the home directory. We had to go up to Vagrant, subdirectory Vagrant, and inside uh, Vagrant, there we are, he had to go up to that. Inside Vagrant, he found Hamlet, right? So now we've got ourselves a little utility for searching directories. We got a little, ourselves a little utility for searching for particular files. Let's start looking at uh, TCP message passing, just simple message passing. File open. Are we still on? Yep, okay. So let's bring up client. Uh, and you guys have. Guess what? Look how similar this is to UDP. It's almost the exact same code. We're just doing a couple of things different. We're just filling this out, even this statement where we spin up our object. The only thing different here is we're saying, instead of dgram, we're saying give us a stream protocol. We want to use IPv4 and we want to use stream. So he's going to pull those routines out and put them in that object. Then we're going to take input. Uh, you know, the port number, we got to do typecasting. Remember, we talked about that, right? We got to have an integer put in here. So we're going we're gonna to take input first, we're going to convert it into an integer and put it in that variable. Then we're going to issue the connect. And after that, look how much I care about, you know, the TCP three way handshake, you know, the, um, what is it, the uh, LLC, the link layer. You know, Sabum and Sabumi, you know, how many frames can you have? Yeah, we don't care. That, the object is handling all that stuff, right? It's passing it off to the network adapter. It's saying, hey, do this, do that. It's doing all that stuff for us. Um, then we're going to say, hey, and this is just getting fancy, give us the socket name. When you connect and you get a connection to that server, remember, we bring up that client connection. We're now going to be able to query what that, what that name is. We're going to send in a message, very clever hello server message, um, and we're just going to issue a send, right? We're going to wait for the server to respond with up to 1024 bytes. I, I just pull that number out of the air, right? And then we're going to print it out, and away we go. We shut it down, and we're done. So let's... Um, Let's do it from the Windows side, uh, the server, just to keep us honest here. Let's open. Go up to our TCP. Uh, and we want server, right? So let's look at server. Can everybody see this? We're really not doing anything different at all. Um, except the server stuff, right? Remember what we talked about, the server, his, his main role, when you des that's why you designate him a server, right? Um, he's gonna, his main uh, function in life is going to be pulling in connection requests, putting them on his list, setting up the socket, and then saying, hey, you know what, go for it. Do whatever you got to do. I'm out of here, right? Um, that's where this stuff comes in. Once he's done, he's going to pull one off that uh, outstanding listen. He's going to, we're going to print out the IP address. He's going to accept it, give us the information. We're going to receive a message from the client. We're going to dump it out to the screen, and then we're going to send him something back. Everybody get that? Thumbs up. Who wants to see this crash and burn? No? All right. I don't want to see this crash and burn. All right, so 192.168.56. Uh, dot, what are we, one? Yes. And I'm going to select a port. This could be anything I want. But this will bomb if I step on another port. This will come back with an um, inappropriate use of port something. I think it's like an error 161, something like that. So 
you really got to look up what you, you should be aware of, what ports are running, what you can use. I'm going to use a high number, right, to just, just reserve and use that. So 55,000, this is what he's listening on. So he's sitting on those accepts now. He's spinning, I'm sorry, on that listen. And in fact, if we go down, uh, oh, I, sh I should turn this server off. Um, if we do a net stat, on uh, anyone that's doing a listen, we should see we should see find string listen move we got a lot of them uh, we should see uh, we're using TCP, right? So let's go up and look and see if we, oh, there's our address right there. There's our guy. He's hanging out. He's just waiting. Here's his process number, and he's just waiting, listening, right? Now, when you're using TCP, you want to be uh, very careful with the ports that you allocate. Even though you get a free allocation, what happens when a TCP connection shuts down? What happens? Anybody know? Uh, we all know. We're, we're network people, man. We live this stuff. What happens is the socket may close. We may shut that down, but it's a streaming protocol. So you're going to have probably bytes in flight, right? Stuff is going to be still in flight between the server and the client. That is why you have a three-way handshake up front, and then you have this fin... You have this you know, whole crazy stuff going on. Those adapters may be shut. Those, those sockets may be shut. But he's still waiting to clean up the mess that you were spewing out earlier, right? So what that means is if you shut one down, you shut your program down, and then, oh, I didn't mean that. You start it up again, it's not going to let you do that because it's still waiting. It's saying, hey, man, you asked me to clean this thing up. Now you, you want the port back. Can't be an Indian giver, OK? Everybody get that? So we're going to trip over that a couple times. I guarantee it. Uh, so what are we doing on this side? OK, client. So 192.168.56.1 was the address, right? 55,000. There we go. So what we did was we connected to the server uh, here was the socket name. What's the socket name? That's, that's the quiz. What, what's the socket name? IP and the port number, right? In this case, notice that it's different. That's his, his port number that was just allocated. We send, I'm sending a server hello message, and he's waiting for a response. Server comes back, hello client. All right, let's go look at the Windows side. Okay, now the, the, um, the client came in. He said, here's where we're listening. Uh, oh, I got an accept. Somebody came in, came in from this host, and here's his port. Uh, here's the message he sent me. Hello, server. Well, I'm going to send him a big-time message back. Hello, client. Right? So, now... He sends a response, client shuts down. That connection is now freed, right? So now we're going to sit and we're going to say, hey, do you want me to keep going? I'm in that while loop, right? I've shut the, the connection down, the object down, but I'm still spinning if I want to. So let's, um, let's try it again. One nine two dot one six eight dot fifty six dot one, and it was fifty five thousand. Fifty five thousand. There you go. Another one. Hello. Very imaginative. Came in again. Got the connection. Notice the number has changed, right? Everybody get this? It's not too hard, right? 
Who's going to try this when they get home? I didn't see every hand go up. Um, and if you don't, I mean, if this doesn't work or something goes wrong, let me know. I, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but anybody who participated today gets a free car. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> Not true. Not true. Anybody who participated today, they set up a, um, a, a spark room. So there were th this is technically three sessions. So we signed up, the speaker signed up to monitor these spark rooms. So you can go in, and, and I encourage you guys to run this stuff and talk between yourselves. This blew up, whatever. I'll be looking. I'm going to be in India next week, but, so I won't be like on it, on it. But I've certainly got a couple of blogs. Please comment. You know, please... Whether you like this, you didn't like it, you know, could have done this better, whatever, improve it, say we could have done this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Keep this going, yeah. Sorry? Python 3? It's a great question. Difference between 3 and 2? I would say for all intents and purposes, for what we're going to use it for, this, will, this is uh, Python 2.7, so it's going to work with... Are we, what are we doing? Think about what we're doing. This is a great question. What are we doing here? We're setting up an operating environment on a server. We're setting up an operating environment on our client. And we're saying, we don't give a, we don't give a rat's hoot who's doing what where. All we care about is our little world. So on our machine, we're saying, hey, Python, Go get the socket library. Go get me a subset of those modules uh, and use it this way. That server could be Java. It could be Perl. It could be an Apache web server somewhere. So it, it could be three. It could be two. It could be 10,000, right? It could be anything. That's the beauty of this. It's completely portable. And you're really only worried about your little world, right? So uh, that was a good question. Now. Can I take, to take, I think the other question is, can I take this, load, late 3.5? So, like crazy stuff like, uh, I will tell you, 3.5 uh, came out, and I don't know why they did this. 3 came out a couple of years ago, and they said, hey, you know what? Somebody woke up one day and said, let's come out with a new version of Python, and let's make it not backwardly compatible. And that went over like a lead balloon. Right? So ever since that day, you know, the 2.7, there is so much stuff out there that's running 2.7 and below that they are saying, what are you guys smoking, right? You can't, you can't just do this. So this big religious battle started. Everybody got started getting crazy. And the out, out roar, the, you know, the craziness was crazier than the presidential election in the U.S., right? It was nuttier than that. What happened was they said, okay, we're going to take 3.5, and we'll make it backwardly, we'll make some things backwardly compatible with 2.7. So they put all this functionality in 3.5 so that you can use 2.7. So uh, I can write in 2.7 all the print statements. They won't work in 3.5. But I can code... 3.5 print statements into 7 uh, code, right? Now, there is flat out, hands down, 3.5 is the wave of the future. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. But I will tell you, if you get 2.7 down, the reason I picked 2.7 was there is just more, there is boatloads of examples and YouTube videos. There's just tons of stuff out there that is 2.7 oriented. You learn this, the, the transition to 3.5 is nothing. And They've made so much stuff backwardly compatible that it's easy to do, right? There's even utilities that'll do it for you, right? Uh, that, that you can download. Uh, it's, one's called Pi, uh, no, not Pi to exe, uh, Pi 2 to 3, 2 to 3. All right, so moving right along. We, so what do we got? We got, we know how to get through a directory. We know how to search for a specific file in a directory. We know how to pass simple messages back and forth. What's the next step? That would be TCP number two. <laughs> that would be two. Let's open client two and see what we're doing here. So, um, 
doing the same thing here, nothing different. Uh, getting a bunch of input from the user. We're doing our connect to our host. We're going to send them a message. But what message are we going to send them? We're, the message we're going to send is, as soon as we connect, the first, like last time all we did was the client came up and sent a message to the server. The server sends it one back, goodbye. We just made a minor change. All we're going to do is take a file name from the user, and we're going to send that file name to the server. So the first thing the server is going to see when it comes up is that file name. It's going to pull the file up, and it's going to send it back to me, back to the client. Now, how is it going to do that? We talked about that earlier. It's going to find that file. It's going to open the file for binary reading. It's going to start shoving the stuff out the wire. The client on my side is going to pull in a bunch of stuff, a block at a time, 10, 24 bytes at a time. I'm going to open a file for writing in binary. I'm going to write that out, and as soon as that stream stops, as soon as I test, I get an empty you know, receive. I do a receive and there's nothing there. I'm going to know that that socket is shut down. Shut down the socket, turn off the server, I got my file. Right? So let's do, let's do the server on this side. Um, just for. Just to get crazy here, we'll do the server on the Linux side. What do you think? We're out of control. Uh, doing the same thing. Oh, we were doing the server on the server side. All right, so let's start it up. Let's start it up. We'll enter this host address, 192.168. 56. We are 101, right? What port number do you want? That's, that's a great point. We have, the other thing we're tripping over is we've got reserved port numbers. The INAN or whoever owns those ports have reserved ports. So we've got to keep those numbers high, right? So let, I, let's just pick 45,000 and hope nobody's using it. All right, so now we're bound, okay, and we're listening. Let's, uh, let's bring up the client on this side. Let's do file open. I'm in TCP, client two. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to take the file name from the user. Uh, we're going to you know, connect to him, and we're going to send him that file name. Um, and, oh, by the way, when he starts dumping stuff back to me, I'm going to do receive of up to 1024 bytes a shot. I'm going to take 1024 bytes, put it in here, and then I'm going to start writing it to disk. Right? I've opened a file, I'm going to write it to disk. So let's, um, let's do that. So I'm going to connect to 192.168.56.101. Uh, port number 45,000, 45 million. Uh, let's do Hamlet. And we blew up. Hold on. Ah, why did this blow up? The path is not there. We, we're running our server. He came in with a, hey, server, need this file. Server went and looked in his local current directory. Whoops. He barfed and died. Let's try it again. Only this time, let's, um, let's run it from, let's put, um, let's put Hamlet where he can do some good. Where is Hamlet? There he is. All right, let's put him in the TCP directory. Right? Let's fire him back up. Is this the server? Let's see if that port's freed up yet. We called, we uh, locked up port 45,000, right? Let's see if it's, lo if it's freed. And let's see what happens if it's not. Uh, 192.168.1. 
45,000. Whoops, it's already in use. That uh, adapter, your lower layer drivers, have not freed that up, man. They, they, that previous attempt might be still sitting in their NIC buffers, right? So we got to use a different number, sorry. Um, it's fired up. 192.168.56.101. One, one, uh, Let's do 4501, uh, 4500. Easier to remember. All right, so we got the server listening. Let's do our, is this our client? No, that's the server. Let's just do this. Hate bouncing around like this. Uh, we were on server two, so let's do client two. Edit. Everybody knows what we're doing here, right? We tried this before and it failed miserably. Let's do 192.168.56.101. And connect on 45100. File name. There you go. He went in. Uh, he could only search his local directory. Got, got Hamlet. Shoved him out the wire. I'm sitting there receiving. Now, this is a small file. If this were a large file, I'd have to do more receives. I'd spin on that, spin, spin, spin. Um, but again, this is where you run into trouble with your uh, programming cousins. When they start talking about performance issues, one of the things we've got to start tracking down is, is it really the network, right? Uh, it's not your program. It's not the network. Let's look somewhere else, right? Especially when you're dealing with TCP streams, right? So uh, I got Hamlet. Let me make sure I got Hamlet. What the, let's look at the directory here. Should be in the TCP directory. And there he is, the famous Hamlet soliloquy. Okay. So now we need to add a little capability to that server. Um, we need to, let's just shut him down. Now well, he's actually, nah, let's shut him down. We're going to lose this port now, right? As soon as we shut this guy down. He's in that loop. He's still locked there. If we do a listen, we look for anybody listening on this machine, we're going to see that IP address is still hung. So I got to find, I got to find somewhere else now. All right, so let's go to three. Now we got to step up our game. We got to go, first let's delete Hamlet in this directory so we don't inadvertently find him. Um, let's go get, let's go get number three. Uh, number three, we want to do server, right? Number three, no big deal. Exactly the same thing. This is where we start building these little utilities and start gluing them together. Here's our, here's our directory OS walk stuff that we just talked about. That's all we added to this, right? So we're going to start searching wherever we tell it to start searching until it finds a file. But other than that, it's exactly the same. Uh, 192.168. Dot 56 dot 101. I don't know, 52,000? Keep your fingers crossed. All right. Our root directory, let's start searching from uh, the home directory. Because uh, the Hamlet file's in, uh, it's in the vagrant directory, so we'll go one, one up from that. So we think, unless this blows up, do TCP number three. Oh, that's server. Sorry. We want client. Now, we're not going to talk about the V6. I just put it in there if you guys want to look at it. It's the same thing. I mean, it works. I, I just didn't want to deal with 
the size of uh, addresses, to IPv6 addresses and flows and, uh, all right, 192.168.56, who's our server, 101? What was the port? Uh, do a little cheating here. It was like 42, 52, 5200, 52,000. So, 52, 1, 2, 3. File name Hamlet. Dot text. There you go. Went into home, didn't find it in home. Said, got to go up the stack. Went into uh, our vagrant home directory. Bang, Hamlet is there. Pardon me? Could you? I. I Sorry, it found it in TCP because you moved it in, so not in Vagrant. What, what happened was the server, the, the TCP connection is almost, it's, um, it was in a separate folder. And what we did was we added the OS walk code logic into that server, nothing different. Uh, you know, he came in and he said, oh, I can't find this. Step back to, the, to home, nothing's there. Looks through that, no subdirectories, no files. Says, okay, let me go to the next one. Here's a subdirectory called Vagrant. Oh, there's Hamlet. Bang. Pulls it up. He opens it up, starts streaming out the bytes. I'm collecting them as fast as I can, writing them out in binary. Bang. We're done. Ten minutes for the whole thing. We got, <laughs> we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, we Seriously, I hope you guys brought a sleeping bag because <laughs> we are going to be here. We're going to be here. I'm, ser I'm kidding. Um, let me just show you a couple things. Fool around with it, seriously. This was not intended to cover everything today. Uh, it's intended to give you a starting point to use the repository, get on the blogs, add comments, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, let me just show you what we're, what's out there. Uh, we talked about TCP, OS walk, blah, blah, blah. This is the, the server. We talked about this, right? Message passing. If we didn't, we know it. Let's move beyond this. What we have out there after TCP is security. And I do want to show you one thing, now that I think of it. I want to show you hashing, uh, because you can use this, like, tomorrow morning. And I'm not talking about the illegal hashing. I'm talking about the legal. Open. go to hash, and I'll finish with this. Ah, wrong. I have the worst fat fingers on the planet. Hash. Where's the list? All right. So when we hash something, it's just nothing but math, right? It's... Um, some rocket scientist somewhere came up with this really cool way of taking prime numbers and jumbling them all together, taking a, a string of bytes, you know, putting them in a blender, and coming up with these weird numbers that nobody can reproduce. And it's the way that we sign things. So you want to verify that you're getting something from somewhere, you're going to generate a hash, a digital signature, right? And there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. And one of the things that we were going to talk about uh, if anybody wants to stay until 10 o'clock tonight, is uh, an SSL tunnel. And one of the important things that goes on in setting up that tunnel, the very first couple things that happens is what? What happens? I'll tell you what happens. <laughs> you set up the tunnel, you, you, you've got you to decide on what kind of key exchange the two are gonna, uh, can handle and what they can do. You've got to agree on a cipher. Do I want to use AES? Do I want to use Blowfish? You know, what RC4? Blah, 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 right? You want, to, you want to send secret numbers that you can both calculate secret stuff with, right? And then you want to bring up the connection and start, you know, we talked about tunneling, right? You set up this encrypted tunnel and you pass the TCP traffic through it, right? So this hash is one of the things this hashing algorithm capability is one of the things that can be useful in uh, 
not only doing the encryption piece, but ensuring that, uh, like if I set this server up, and I tell you guys, and I call this server, my PC, I call it Cisco.com, and we run these programs that are out here, you can connect in, and I can steal a couple of Cisco.com screens and stand them up on simple HTTP server. And you'll happily give me your login information. There we go, right? So hashing is one way that we can use to make sure that you are who you say you are. And that was really our, our next kind of thing. What we do in the next step after TCP, now that we can find a file anywhere, we go and we, when the client is going to ask us, hey, give me the hash for Hamlet as the first message. Server is going to go in, calculate the hash, and send it back to them. Client is going to save that on a hash file. Then the client's going to go ask the server again, hey, go get me Hamlet. Server's going to pass back our file transfer, pass back Hamlet, and then the client's going to run the hash again. And if those two hashes don't meet, you know somebody was fooling around with Hamlet. Right? So this is why this is valuable, right? And we'll just, this is just a little utility that we ran to um, just dump out what the various strings will look like. So, uh, you know, this is the right? This is the legal form of hash. So what it does is it takes that string that we entered and it just runs through it first it tells you what can I support as Python, this, this release of Python. These are the, the algorithms I support. And then it's going to take this string and apply each one to the string. And you can see as you get down to 512, pretty cool, right? And I literally can take, cut and paste these strings out and use them as valid if I ever want to hide or make sure that nobody, you know, if I have a file somewhere, I can and if you don't believe me, I put in a, um, that web browser thing in this code so you can go check. So let's bring that up. It's going to take you to that. Um, this is the same thing that we did to point you earlier to the repository. And this, I shouldn't have done it on this machine. Let me do it on this, this, um, this VM is very disappointing. Uh, let me open hash. Hash list. Let me run it. And we'll finish with this. Hello. Hello world. And let's try to launch that page again. Uh, this is just an online encryption website. You can, there's a million of them out there. Just pick one. What we're going to do is um, let's, let's take an example just to prove we're not lying. Let's do, uh, I don't know, pick one, 256. Let's do a cut and paste. And what was that? It was hello world exclamation mark. Let's go to uh, SHA-256. Can I find it? Yes. And we said, nah, fat fingered again. We said um, it was hello, all lowercase, right? H-E-L-L-O world exclamation. Let's just see if they jive. So after we get through all the commercials, Here's, uh, and we didn't get to talk to encoding, but here's the, the various forms that that hash, that when they run it for you, we always, when we're talking about hashes, we always talk about it, or you always see it in terms of hex. Well, you can, you can put it out in any different kind of form. The most common form is hexadecimal. So let's see if this jives uh, with what we, we ran. So we begin with... Somebody do me a favor. Can somebody memorize this number so we can go back and forth? No? All right. Let's just look if I can not fat finger this thing again. So uh, we did 256, right? 75909E. 
750-09E, uh, blah, 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 blah. If anybody wants to check it, run it yourself. Have a great time. Um, we can't, I mean, we're out of time, right? Uh, I, I'm serious. I would love to go on. We got two minutes left. Has this been useful, or is it the greatest waste of your time ever? <laughs> One or the other. It was either the greatest experience of your entire life or the worst thing that ever happened to you, right? I'm hoping you're going to go with one, and you guess what that is. <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate your time. I hope this is helpful. Again, take this stuff, steal it, change it around. You don't have to get crazy with it, right? Get a little bit working, get a little bit more working. If you have any questions, you know, go to the blogs. Uh, I wrote three of them that nobody, I wrote like three blogs. The first time I did any blogging, nobody responded. So. Well, at least respond. <laughs> yes. Actually, uh, at the end of the day, what we will have to do is uh, connect to Cisco devices and do several stuff using Python, right? So the question is, uh, do you recommend any library, Telnet or SSH to use? Uh, I'm not. Uh, That's a great net, question. Netcon for uh, just Telnet and SSH libraries that we use to. So to you could to. you could really make this SSH uh, client that that is up there, that's in the SSH subdirectory in the uh, the uh, repository. You could turn that into a, an SSH connection to you know any kind of anything you want. Anybody that talks SSH. That's all we're going to do. The problem is, if you use this code, is with the certificates. So we got we to gotta verify that we are who we say we are. And the guy that we're talking to, the server that we're talking to, has a, a valid certificate that they bought from VeriSign or whatever, right? So they're going to go out, they're going to buy, they're going to certify that these guys are not you know, fly-by-night, sneaky dudes, right? They're going to check them out. They're going to send them a certificate. Away they go. I'm going, to, I'm going to contact them via my browser. We're going to do that whole negotiation thing. Uh, and as part of that, the certificate, I'm going to ask, hey, buddy, let's see your certificate. You've got to ship that to me, and I'm going to check it against a VeriSign or some, a certificate authority. And they're going to say, yeah, he's OK. Or they're going to say, no. And at that point, the browser is going to stop. Now, what we did to make this thing work, all we did was the cheapest El Cheapo, just make it work thing we could do. So I used on Ubuntu, and the instructions are out there in the directory. In Ubuntu, it comes with this thing called o OpenSSL that lets you generate your own certificates. So if you want to pretend that you're Vince Kelly from Media, Pennsylvania, you are more than welcome to do that. Because there, <laughs> there's a certificate out there that I generated. But there's also instructions for generating your own just to you know, go back and forth and do the testing. Right? Thumbs up, bat down. Good. Thanks, guys. I, I definitely appreciate your time. This was a lot of fun. No tomatoes came out. <laughs> Let me know how you make out. Thank you.